Hi guys, it's Lauren Daisy. Welcome back to my channel and welcome to the long-awaited Blair Waldorf deep dive. I'm the best of the best. I'm Blair Waldorf. Today is going to be exactly like my Serena deep dive. We're going to go through everything. We're going to go through TV tropes. Um, we're going to go through each season individually. And we're also going to go through um, a little bit on love interest and style friendships and then just kind of a kind of conclusion final thoughts at the end and we're also going to talk about your thoughts because I asked you on reddit um if you want to kind of be I guess kind of involved in these videos I usually do um polls about characters over on reddit in the pre Liars, gossip girl desperate housewives subreddit just gonna get straight into it um if you want a tutorial on how i got my kind of blair look today that will be up in blair's style deep dive um that will be coming um, soon <laughs> at some point but in that i'm going to talk more in depth about her style and i also have a video on my channel already ranking her love interests and i talk more in depth about them specifically in that video as well so there's a lot more blair content already on my channel and to come as well but let's get into the deep dive So Blair Cornelia Waldorf is her full name and she was born on November 15th, 1990, which makes her a Scorpio. I think that fits her very well. Her sort of like promiscuous side and the sort of mystery that she has um, surrounding her and her character, um, I think fit her very well. But then at the same time, Scorpio is also very emotional, quite sort of secretly um they're not as outwardly emotional as say like cancers but they are also a water sign which makes them emotional but i think people don't really associate that kind of trait with scorpios it's definitely more of the mysterious um like darker side and i think blair is a good representation of both so blair is easily one of the most iconic tv characters of our generation she's intelligent strong-minded and although she can be she can have kind of a cold exterior at times. She is genuinely kind-hearted deep down. And we do get to see that a lot throughout the show. I think she is one of the most complex characters that we get to see. And one of the most fleshed out characters as well. Despite being very sure of herself and kind of who she is. She can be insecure at times. Especially when it comes to her best friend Serena Vanderwoodson. Again I talked about this in my Serena deep dive as well. You kind of can't talk about... Blair without talking about Serena and kind of vice versa. Because she is the queen bee of Constance, that can make her act quite cruel sometimes. But we see throughout the series that most of the time her heart is in the right place. But it can be kind of a pro as well because I think it makes her very ambitious, it makes her very determined, and she is less likely to let people walk all over her, like kind of how Serena is. Maybe I am a total bitch. Did you ever think about that? So now we're going to talk about her TV tropes. So I would say her biggest trope is probably the anti-hero one. Um, Taylor Swift fans out there, I think that song is her to a T. Um, she, despite acting kind of malicious at points and, you know, she can do conniving things, she is undeniably a very likeable character. And I think those parts of her also make her more interesting and people root for her because of that, far more so than they root for Serena. As the show progresses, she takes on the breakout character trope and I have a whole video coming on this about how shows will often start off with one person who they believe kind of should be the antagonist, um, one person who they kind of believe should be the protagonist or the sort of main character. But as the show develops, they see and find what they have with another character, not only in their kind of how they portray that character, but also how the audience responds to them. And then that person will take more of the forefront. And I think that's definitely true with Gossip Girl. I think around season even in season two maybe but probably like from season three onward Blair is most definitely the main character whereas Serena is the one that is intended to be the main character because the show starts when she comes back in the books it's definitely more centered around her being the main character and I think it's interesting that there was that shift 
to Blair in the later seasons. Serena and Blair's friendship is a perfect, like almost textbook, I would say, example of the light feminine versus dark feminine trope, with Serena being the more light and bubbly, um, like cutesy, friendly, um, everyone loves her, um, you know, kind of friend. Whereas Blair is more of the mysterious and cunning and glamorous um, type friend with the dark feminine traits. Serena is so grateful because she likes to see the best in people. I like to see the truth. Even like in the Saints and Sinners party in the Witches of Bushwick, I think it's called, Serena comes as a saint. She comes in this, you know, like really cute, um, lovely gray dress. And Blair comes as a sinner and she's in her kind of like short red dress with the black lace. Um, and I think that is a great kind of example of that. She has a kind of even though her style, I would say, doesn't really represent dark feminine, I think her character most certainly does. I've said this before, but I think Serena and Blair, they are complete opposites. They use those characters to kind of pit against each other to show the exact opposites of each other. They like reflect each other um, and what the other person isn't. You know, if if Serena's pink then Blair's purple and if Serena's day then Blair's night and if Serena's gold then Blair's silver it's definitely that kind of thing and I kind of like that they sort of keep that to the end and at some points even flip it um so that Serena becomes the more kind of selfish friend and Blair becomes more of the bubbly friend I think it's really interesting how they do that but even through the character development, they had to have them on opposing sides. They also complement each other with Serena being the girl next door trope and Blair being the kind of alpha bitch trope. She is definitely the kind of head bitch in charge, you know, in with the kind of Alice and Dina Rentises and the Cheryl Blossoms and um, the Naomi Clarks, like those kinds of characters that are truly you know, they are in charge, they rule the school, um, and she carries that throughout, even as she does become softer and she becomes nicer, that strain is still there, which I do really enjoy that they kind of kept that as part of her character. And lastly, Chuck and Blair play into the will they won't they trope, or as I like to call it, the Ross and Rachel trope. Um, they do this throughout the whole series, sort of realising they have feelings for each other, but then one of them messes it up and then they look like they're going to get together and then they do get together but then they break up and then it looks like they're going to get together again but then they don't and it's just that constant back and forth that definitely can get a bit like oh my god just like you know get on with it already decide if they're going to be together or they're not um but it does definitely keep you invested in them and in their story okay so we're going to start with season one the very beginning of course and when Blair is introduced she's definitely introduced as an antagonist for Serena, which is really funny when you kind of watch the whole show. Like if you were to watch um, kind of like how, um, I think his name's Dylan on YouTube, how he watches the first episode and the last episode. I can't even imagine how confused you would be if you watched the first episode of Gossip Girl and the last one, because it's, and to be fair with Dan and Serena, you probably wouldn't be that confused. But I feel like with Blair, she changes so much and in that first episode, she's truly like bad bitch villain energy. It's very true to how she is in the books. I did an entire uh, video on the fact that I read the first Gossip Girl book and the differences between the book and the show. And one of the things that I really noticed was that the pilot is very true to the book in making Blair a villain because she's very spiteful in the books. And I think almost immediately after that first episode, she becomes a lot more layered. She's not just a villain. She has these kind of other things going on with her parents. We explore that more with the dynamic with Serena is explored a lot more um, and the kind of underlying problem she has there and why she is the way that she is. And we get to see the nicer side of her and the more caring side. But just in that first episode, we're really introduced to her as Serena, Dan, you know, Jenny, there are good guys, Chuck, 
Blair, they are our bad guys. She's definitely a sparring partner for Serena and we see that she has been ruling the school in Serena's absence because Serena obviously comes back in. She has a huge impact. Everybody knows her, everybody loves her. And we get that feeling that Blair was more of a sort of sidekick to her when she was the one ruling the school. But now that Serena has stepped back, Blair's been able to come to the forefront and once Serena comes back that is threatened. Like I said you can see that impact from when she hears about Serena coming back instantly and there's so many more layers to it as you go through that first season because it seems kind of like oh she was her ex-best friend and then she just wanted to be queen but then you realize no she also there's clearly this thing going with her and Nate and Blair says that she always knew there was something there's the whole thing with her mother choosing Serena over her and favoriting her and um you know the people at school and just constantly kind of living in her shadow and then you have the fact that as well Serena was her best friend despite all that and she left her and she didn't say goodbye and she didn't speak to her for a whole year and I think that is one of Blair's biggest heartbreaks in this show um, is the fact that Serena left and she didn't say why. We also see in this first episode how one-sided her relationship with Nate truly is. There's no real reciprocation there. Um, as soon as he finds out that Serena is back that is where his attention goes to and you kind of see that you know, we're not only introduced to how mean she can be, but like I said, also why she is the way that she is from when we see her interact with her mum for the first time to when we see her interacting with Serena and everyone around her. No one is really, despite her being the Queen Bee, nobody's really focused on her, not even her own mother or father. They're all caught up in their own things. And the one person who's supposed to care about, or the two people that are supposed to care about her the most, her boyfriend and her best friend, have both betrayed her. So going into her main plot lines, we're going to start off with the Blair, Serena, Nate love triangle, which is actually really short-lived. I feel like it's such a big thing, but in the show, when you actually look at it, it does not last for a long time. And once it's this initial stage is over, they never once fight over him again. It's always... Chuck and, you know, Chuck versus Nate, Dan versus Nate, Dan versus Chuck, like, for, you know, with Serena and Blair being the third party, this is kind of the only time that they're actually caught in a love triangle together, um, which I think I enjoy because, like I said, I like them as friends or like frenemies, whatever you want to call them, and I like that this is kind of the only real time they ever clash over a guy, and even then, it's resolved quite quickly. So yeah, when Serena returns, it stirs up old feelings for Blair's current boyfriend, Nate Archibald. When Blair hears that Serena is back, she's more determined than ever to have sex with Nate for the first time. I think that kind of, will she thinks, will bring them closer and will maybe kind of lock that in. And I went on a whole thing about this in my Jenny Humphrey Deserves a Better video where I talked about how I think it's a shame that there is this idea that um, people have to have sex with their partner in order to keep them around or keep them interested or to feel like they are truly committing themselves to that person and I just don't believe that that's true and I think it's definitely more of an issue in younger people I would say specifically younger girls but definitely you know it does affect everybody that kind of pressure to not only um keep up with the kind of people around you but also that's kind of what society teaches you is that you get into a relationship and once you are committed to that person that is the next step but I don't feel that Blair was truly that ready I think on some level she obviously loved him and that was the person she wanted to have her first time with but I think hearing that Serena had come back definitely made her think I need to seal the deal in order to keep Nate um, and I think it's a real shame that she felt like that was what she had to do to compete with Serena and Blair continues to try to sleep with him um, throughout the first episode and he eventually just feels too guilty and can't go through with it because he doesn't want to have 
her believe that it's his first time and obviously that being her first time to be taken from her that fairy tale kind of experience of she is having sex for the first time and it's with her boyfriend who she loves and who she believes loves her and he couldn't go through with it because he knew what he had done and that is sleeping with Serena so he tells her that he slept with Serena before she left for boarding school while obviously they were together initially she obviously screams at him to get out and she's really mad at him but she ends up forgiving him I don't it's kind of a tricky one I think she maybe didn't necessarily genuinely forgive him but I think she takes him back because he's firstly he's something that she has that Serena doesn't have and by staying with him it's something that Serena isn't able to take from her I think also having Nate as her boyfriend really plays into her queen bee role I think her kind of want to look perfect on the outside includes having the perfect boyfriend and I think a part of that also was denial over the fact that Nate did really love Serena I think by Blair taking him back and him staying with her she thought well that must mean that he does love me and he doesn't love Serena and I think there was an element of denial there over what had really happened and the kind of level of betrayal that had gone on I have reacted it you say it's in the past it's in the past I'm sure you have no feelings for her anymore I just feel bad for Serena I should really miss you I think there's an interesting pattern that happens here and maybe I could do a whole video on it. Let me know if you would want to see it. But I think there is definitely a lot of, with Blair specifically, I think throughout the show there is a lot of instances of this. But I think specifically with Blair there is a lot of internalised misogyny and I think she, in situations, definitely forgives the man in the situation quicker and will take it out on the woman in the situation for longer she is a lot more bitter towards serena in this situation than she is with nate and we have a couple more scenarios like that coming up as we we talk about them but i think it's interesting to be fair i think there's a lot of that in teen shows and kind of shows in general from this sort of time I would say you know like early 2000s mid 2000s and you know even in Pretty Little Liars we kind of see it as well but I think it's I definitely notice it more in Gossip Girl with all the characters to be fair with Vanessa Serena um but I think Blair is definitely where I first started to notice it the most so from this we go on to her feud with Serena because obviously Serena shuts it down with Nate in the pilot I'm pretty sure and her going on with Nate we're going to leave that for now and we're going to look at her feud with Serena we're going to go down that road Serena and Blair end up going for drinks and they make up but their friendship is broken again obviously once Nate reveals that he slept with Serena um so that is immediately fractured and I think it's interesting that Serena felt as though Blair was just going to take her back as a friend because Blair was seriously hurt by her and what she did before she even knew that Serena had slept with her boyfriend. So I think Blair actually handled this situation quite well because if your best friend left for a year and didn't tell you, didn't reach out, you know, your parents had gotten divorced, not to mention the fact she doesn't come back to see Blair, she comes back to see Eric. So if that thing hadn't happened with Eric, how, who knows how long she would have gone without speaking to Blair. So the fact that she even agreed to meet Serena, I think, is actually quite good progress. I thought everything was good between us. It was. Before I found out you had sex with my boyfriend. Oh my god, this is the longest that anyone has not talked ever. There is nothing you could say to make this worse, so just say something! And while obviously finding out that Serena had slept with her boyfriend didn't help matters, I think a lot of this feud definitely stems from Blair's insecurity towards Serena. Not wanting to lose her newfound queendom that she has at Constance to her, because as we know, you know, as we see, Blair, and I think a lot of other people in the show and fans can see that everything comes really easily to Serena, it comes quite naturally and I think Blair feared that she would be able to just waltz in like she does with everything and take that back from her. Then at the Ivy League mixer, Blair outs Serena for being a drug addict and going to the Offshore Centre, um, which was obviously a very vile 
thing to do. She's very much in her antagonist era still at this point. But she, when she realises that it was actually Eric, we see kind of the, maybe not the first, but a real big moment in her character development and her character depth. Because as soon as she finds out that it was Eric, and obviously she cares about Eric a lot, and that is Serena's brother, she apologises and really regrets what she's done. And she decides to kind of go and look for Serena. And when she finds her, reads her a letter that she wrote to her, which is one of my favourite scenes in the entire show. I think it's such a beautiful scene under the arches and basically tells her that she is sad that she left. And I think once she reads this letter, Serena truly understands the levels that she hurt her because, I mean, classic Scorpio, but Blair is definitely, like I said, you know, kind of a hard exterior. She doesn't show her emotions a lot. And I think maybe Serena assumed she would be fine or because she comes back with quite bitchy, um, more on the, you know, attack that Serena assumed it didn't really affect her that much because she was being so catty and mean about it. And I think this is the first moment where she lets that down and says to Serena, you genuinely hurt me. And then from that point, they can move on as friends because Serena can truly understand what she did to hurt Blair and try to rectify it. Dear Serena, my world is falling apart and you're the only one who would understand. You're supposed to be my best friend. I miss you so much. How's Blair? editing me just jumping in here because i didn't mention this at the time but there is going to be a bit of a trigger warning on this video surrounding eating disorders it's not mentioned a great deal in the show but blair does experience um a particular eating disorder and if you obviously don't want to hear about that or it's something that you kind of struggle with then i am just kind of putting this in here so that you know that is going to be brought up I don't think it's brought up too much in the video, I'm telling you now, and I'll also put a warning if I do talk about it again later in the video, I think around season 4 and 5, we're going to talk about it very briefly, this is probably season 1 is really where we're going to talk about it the most, so completely up to you if you want to keep watching the video or if you feel like it's it's not something that you want to hear about maybe just skip to season two but yeah i just wanted to pop that in here just in case i'm also going to have in the description a couple of resources will be linked in my description if anyone is struggling with those things and also just my love because i know how awful something like that is from personal experience so Yes, I love you all very much. And I just wanted to pop that little disclaimer in just in case. Um, so yeah, I enjoy the rest of the video outside of that. So now we're going to move on to her issues with Eleanor and Harold. So obviously that's her mum and her dad. And we see from the very first episode that Blair doesn't have the healthiest relationship with Eleanor. Um, the kind of first time we even meet Eleanor, she is talking about Blair's weight or she's talking about how she's dressed and she says the infamous quote of you'll never be as beautiful and young and thin or however she says it as you are right now and in those early episodes she constantly pits Blair and Serena against each other um Blair comes down for breakfast and Eleanor's there and she's being really sweet to Serena and Serena's eating this croissant but then when Blair you know comes down she kind of just nitpicks at her all the time which she doesn't do to Serena and which kind of makes sense because obviously Serena isn't her daughter. That would be a bit bizarre. But knowing that that's her best friend and doing that stuff in front of her is really awful. And the way that she treats her initially really shows why she has the issues that she does and why she acts the way that she does. Before you tuck into that, you might find a low-fat yogurt more appealing. I lost two pounds when you are away. And you look marvelous. Darling, please... Serena, you have to come back later when everything is unpacked. I would love to hear your thoughts. You do have such a great personal style. Oh, thank you. And I think what makes it worse and what really resonates with a lot of people is that it is not intentionally malicious. Um, she's not what you would typically class as like an abusive parent or someone that is, you know, disciplining their kids really harshly or being really 
verbally hurtful to them. It's a lot more underlying than that. And it comes from the small comments, like we see in Friends with Monica and her mum. There's that kind of, not outright, but constant scrutiny and the little comments and the things that make you question how you think about everything and how you, especially how you think about yourself. And I think a lot of daughters go through this issue with their mums and they don't even realise, the mums don't even realise that it's happening. But the way that you talk about yourself, the way that you talk about your child um, will soak in and it will affect them, even if you're not intentionally trying to be malicious. And I think that's what they really showcased with Eleanor and Blair. And I think it was very well done. Then as the season progresses, we do see more heartfelt moments with them as they start to rebuild their relationship because the Thanksgiving episode in Blair Waldorf Must Pie, we see that Eleanor purposefully didn't invite Harold, which really upsets Blair. But then when she actually, they talk about it and she explains it was just too hard and she knew that if she gave Blair the option of her or Harold, she would have chosen Harold and then she would have been all by herself. And I think that was a nice moment to see her actually be vulnerable with Blair rather than, again, I think she does what Blair does and puts up this exterior to pretend almost that it's not happening and that everything is fine. So then when we finally do see Harold for the first time and he does return, he brings his partner Roman and Blair doesn't like him obviously because he was the other man in this situation. He's the guy that for her broke up her family and I think that's definitely a normal teen reaction to something like that. Being only 16 or maybe even 15 I think um, I can't remember if she's 15 or 16 in the first season. I think she's 16. She can't quite grasp the depth there. She can't quite understand the complexity of it because for her, it's a very emotional thing. It's a big kind of trauma for her. It's her parents breaking up and finding out that not only did her parents break up, but to her, her dad has kept this huge secret from her, which is that he is gay. And I think because of that, it's hard to see the nuances in it. It's hard to see that they were just unhappy and they were never going to work while Harold wasn't being his true self. And once he is being his true self, again, it's never going to work because that's just not who he wants to be with. And I think as the show goes on, obviously, she, under she learns to understand that far more. But initially, Roman isn't who her dad is supposed to be with. It's, this is the guy that came in and broke up my family. When really Harold is the one that broke up their family and the underlying issues of their relationship were probably there long before Roman came into the picture but Blair takes it out on him and I think that to me made complete sense in the moment and she tries to break them up and then by the end of the episode she realizes that actually Harold is far happier with Roman and that Roman isn't replacing her they are making room for her in his life. They bought this house in Paris and she has her own room and they thought about the fact that it was close to her favorite restaurant and all those kind of things make her feel more secure in it and make her feel a part of it. So now we're gonna move on to a thin line between Chuck and Nate. So despite moving on from the Serena situation, Nate and Blair's relationship still falls apart. The foundation just wasn't there after that. Do you know what I mean? It's, there was never gonna be that real trust there and I think a lot of it because obviously firstly I think Nate um we know does get back together with her because his dad asked him to so there's that level of superficial superficialness whatever you want to call it um to it as well but there is also the fact that I think Blair wanted to cling on to that relationship even though she probably knew that it was one-sided and wanted to cling on to it for image sake and for her and her perfectionist and how she wants her life to look despite the reality of it. And so he doesn't feel like she really has that much time for him. She's quite busy and he can't confide in her about his life. While she is obviously annoyed because she finds out from Jenny that during the masquerade party where Blair was really trying her hardest to pump some life back into their relationship, Nate was off trying to tell Serena that he loved her but accidentally ended up telling Jenny instead. So after her and Nate had this kind of big fight she goes to Chuck's new opening of his like 
weird like club thing called Victrola and she dances on stage and she kind of lets loose this is the first time we sort of see that more rebellious side from her or what she refers to as the Grace Jones to her Grace Kelly and Chuck is obviously very intrigued by this and hasn't really seen this side of Blair before because she's always so prim and proper and he's intrigued by that and he starts to fall for her knowing that she now has this kind of other side to her and they end up having sex in the back of his limo which is Blair's first time having sex. After this Chuck develops feelings for Blair and taunts her with the fact that he can ruin any last ditch effort that she has to be with Nate because again they sort of get back together I think he he sees that she's texting somebody new who is obviously Chuck but he doesn't know that and he becomes kind of obsessed with winning her back all of a sudden now that somebody else has taken her kind of affection away from him. Who are you and what did you do with Blair and Waldorf? She is acting, you know, a little bit different and this because this new side of her is kind of coming out. He also is intrigued by this and she seems more fun and she seems less um, obsessed with perfection like how she was before. So Nate is also intrigued by this and wants to win her back and wants to kind of push whoever this other guy is out of the picture. And because Chuck knows this, he is kind of using it to his advantage. She's so embarrassed about having slept with Chuck, she doesn't even tell Serena about it. Um, but then she ends up seeing the two of them on Blair's 17th birthday when Nate doesn't show up. But Chuck does and Chuck buys her this um, necklace that she had really wanted. They end up kissing and Serena sees them. So then, obviously, like I said, Nate's trying to win Blair back and she does go to the debutante ball with him to Cotillion, like she kind of always wanted to. And she goes with him and they end up sleeping together for the first time and for what he believes is her first time ever. Chuck sees this and it makes him really jealous um, and Nate and Blair become an official couple again. So now we're gonna leave that for a second and we're gonna talk about her feud with Jenny because all oh babes, you know how I love Jenny, okay? I'm a Jenny stan, I ride for that bitch, okay? I die for that bitch and I love her. So I get a little heated talking about Jenny and I'm not going to go too much into it because you can watch my Jenny, my Jenny deserves a better video to hear all about that. But Jenny starts off the season with really admiring Blair. She's one of Blair's kind of like doting minions, right? And Blair happily takes advantage of this until Jenny starts to show more drive than the other minions. You feel me? She's kind of like a little bit of a mini Serena in that Blair kind of senses that competition from her and she doesn't like it. So she tries to stomp it out at every possible stop. And they play this game of truth or dare and they try and one up each other. And Blair really discovers that Jenny has it in her to stand up to Blair and to potentially match her level you know she's got a new sparring partner now that she's friends with Serena again somebody else had to step up to the plate and little Jay's ready Jenny is still she's kind of on the fence she kind of wants to be Blair's friend still and despite Blair kind of basically hazing her is still determined to get to get in with her and she ends up telling Blair that Nate told Jenny that he loved her when he thought that she was Serena. And there's another layer to this because Blair actually told Jenny she couldn't go to the masquerade ball. So not only was she admitting that she'd snuck in, she was telling her that, you know, Nate had said this. And rather than seeing that and being like, oh my God, like, thank you for telling me, or like, I'm glad you came to me and said this, or, you know, she takes it out on Jenny and she is angry at Jenny. You see what I'm saying? You see how that's coming That's coming back into play a little bit? So now we're going to talk about um, Blair's eating disorder. And this is a really poignant story, but I do think it could have been handled a little bit better. So we kind of see hints to Blair's unhealthy relationship with food around her mother. And also, you know, before she's supposed to have her photo shoot for Waldorf Designs, she kind of mentions that she's not going to have breakfast. And when she goes on that sushi date with Nate, there's actually a deleted scene where she does, um, like, go to the bathroom um, in that 
seen, but they ended up cutting it out. So the first real instance we see that they confirm that she does have bulimia is in Blair Waldorf Must Pie, where she has a relapse. And while I did really appreciate seeing Serena's support for her, that she dropped everything to go and see her and she sat with her and she didn't make her feel ashamed, she just made her feel loved. I really did like that, but I do kind of wish that we had seen more that it didn't just kind of get like sweat like it's not really mentioned after that episode and until way later down the line in like season five as much as yeah i did like seeing that support i wish she would have gotten it from more people like eleanor um or nate or there had just been more kind of conversation around it um rather than just that those couple scenes and maybe kind of how that had affected her more throughout the show because that's not the kind of thing that you just sort of get over um speaking from personal experience um this is a storyline that kind of resonated with me not in the bulimia sense but just in the eating you know disorder sense in the relationship with food sense um and i think it resonates with a lot of people and i think a lot of people that have experienced that will also tell you it does not go away super easy. A lot of people, you know, may not struggle with it again, but for a lot of people that have struggled with it, they will, I don't know, it's just kind of one of those things that kind of sticks with you forever. Even if you're not necessarily struggling with it, it'll still come up in other ways and you'll think about it or, you know, maybe she could have helped someone else that was struggling with it. Um, I think that would have been a kind of nice way to round out that story by seeing that she was truly healed from it or seeing it come up a later date, I think would have been, yeah, it would have been good awareness for the topic, I think, um, and seeing her heal from that rather than just, she has a relapse and nobody talks about it ever again. Now we're gonna move on to one of the pinnacles of season one, and that is the who's the daddy scandal. Okay, so Blair confides in Serena that her period is late. So Serena goes to the store and she buys Blair a pregnancy test. But Blair is too afraid to take it. And obviously at this point, Serena doesn't know that Blair has slept with Nate. She only thinks that she slept with Chuck. So she's like, faves, like, come on now. And she doesn't want to take it. And the reason that she doesn't want to take it is because she doesn't know if it is Nate's or if it is Chuck's. And Serena ends up going to Chuck and asking him to talk to her about it. And that's when it's revealed to Serena that Blair had slept with Nate as well. So she kind of understands the whole dynamic a bit more. And anyway, Blair isn't pregnant. Are you kidding me? Ah! <laughs> I'm so happy. You would have had no idea what to wear at a fraternity hearing. <laughs> All seems to be resolved. But then now, because Chuck has this piece of information, he is able to taunt Blair with it again. And this time... Blair stands up to him and says, I know that you're not going to say anything because you value your friendship with Nate too much to ruin it over me. While I think that is true and had Chuck sat and thought about it, he would have been like, you're right. Because in that moment, it was just such a heated moment and she basically dared him. She was like, I know you're not going to do it. And Chuck was like, try me, bitch. He was like, come on then. And he sends a tip into Gossip Girl saying everything. The pregnancy test was for her. It wasn't for Serena. So if she is pregnant, who's a baby daddy? So obviously Blair is mortified. When Nate sees it, he says to Jenny and, you know, Jenny's like, oh, have you seen it? And he's like, oh my God, Blair's going to be devastated that this lie is being spread about her. And, you know, there's no way this is true. And Jenny says, oh. It's, it's true. So then Nate is obviously infuriated, which is kind of a little bit rich. I'm not going to lie because him and Blair were actually broken up. I think Ooh, maybe they weren't broken up when that happened, but he literally slept with Serena and then didn't tell her about it for a year. And like, I get that this is also bad, but also like, kind of look in the mirror a little bit just like a tiny bit i'm not saying that she should have done it because obviously it's still bad to cheat but like i think he went a little bit ott on the whole you know i never want to see you again kind of vibe that he went with pretty much everyone aside from serena turns their back on blair nate doesn't want to speak to her even like chuck doesn't want to speak to her um 
the whole school kind of has turned on her and she wants to flee to Paris. She wants to ignore what's happening and just go. And Serena is able to stop her and convince her to stay because she's like, you know, this will pass and we'll work through it um, together, which I think was a really sweet moment. And I think also gave Blair a little more understanding into why Serena left when she did, because she was kind of facing that same dilemma of do I stay and face what I've done or do I go? And she went. And because of that, she was able to kind of reason with Blair and make sure that she stayed. So then we have the return to Queen B. So like I said, the whole school had kind of turned on her um, because of this scandal and even Jenny. Jenny was kind of leading uh, the minions now and even throws yogurt on Blair on her first day, which I think she's getting a little bit big. I love Jenny, but that was a little bit big for your boots. Like you've only been in charge of the minions for like a day. <laughs> To go and turn on Blair immediately was a little bit a little bit risky, but you know, she did, she went there. And then Blair as revenge and to kind of put Jenny in her place and reclaim the throne ruins her 15th birthday party, which kind of brings the minions back over to her. Obviously it's more of a Serena storyline, but there is the return of Georgina, which doesn't really affect Blair until Serena comes to Blair crying and they have this really heartfelt moment where Blair says, you know, I'm here for you no matter what, whatever it is that you've done. We're sisters, you can tell me anything. Which I think is a really, really sweet scene in their friendship. What is you is me. There's nothing that you could ever say to make me let go. I love you. And Serena tells her that she killed someone in the most iconic TV scene of all time. And Blair is immediately there for her. Kind of like how Serena was, you know, when she dropped everything at Thanksgiving to come to Blair. Blair does the same. She is there for her. She hears her out, just wants to look after her, so desperately wants her to be okay. And I just always loved that dynamic that they could be fighting or they could be bickering or whatever it may be. But when it really hit the fan, they were always there for each other. Blair basically helps to get rid of Georgina. She calls her parents and tells them what's happening and Georgina gets sent away to a like Christian camp. Haven't you heard? I'm the crazy bitch around here. And at the end of the season, Blair and Serena's friendship is obviously in a really good place compared to where it was at the beginning of the season. Um, she and Nate are obviously officially fully done. And at Bart's wedding, Chuck ends up giving this really sweet speech, um, kind of inspired by Blair and they agree to go on a trip to Europe together for the summer. But then Bart gets in Chuck's ear and pretty much sways him not to go. And he doesn't tell Blair that he's not coming, but she goes to the airport, um, well, to the, wherever his like, private jet is, and gets on the plane thinking that he's just going to meet her later on. So now we're on to season two and season two starts with Blair going to visit Serena in the Hamptons and she has started a new relationship with a guy called Marcus Beaton. Oh God. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the Beatons because we have to. So Blair met Marcus while she was traveling Europe over the summer and at first, you know, he's a distraction from Chuck, but then once she finds out that he's like a lord or like British royalty or something, um, then she decides she's actually into him, <laughs> which we often see Blair do this. She does the same thing with Louis where she will prioritize more superficial qualities over personality. <laughs> she's always had this kind of dream of being a princess. So when she hears that he's royalty, that kind of takes over and she becomes more attracted to him. To be fair, she doesn't even really because they don't have like any real sexual chemistry, but she becomes more interested in him when she finds that out rather than just liking him for him, which to be fair, he's really dull. So I don't blame her on that front, but yeah. Blair doesn't really make a great impression on Catherine, who is Marcus's stepmom when she first meets her. But then when she finds out that she's sleeping with Nate, she is like, basically holds it over her head and they become civil. Until 
Vanessa tells Blair that Marcus is sleeping with Catherine. Yep. The stepmother and the stepson. Absolute nasty business. And so she, you know, breaks up with Marcus and kind of banishes them from the Upper East Side. This is kind of how Blair always gets her way, is usually through scheming. I feel like... Oh, I don't want to get into the end of the show yet because we're going to get there. But I feel like it bugs me because we get so much character development from her and we see her kind of change her ways from this scheming side to get everything that she wants. And then in season six, they just regress her character. So yeah, but we'll get to that. So then we're gonna move on to losing the crown once again. So when Serena is in her kind of, doesn't give a shit about anybody, just broken up with Dan, you know, era, because she's kind of becoming a little bit more ruthless and queen-like, the minions start to crowd around her again, uh, rather than Blair, which puts Blair back into the shadows where she doesn't want to be. And in order to get revenge, sort of, she moves Serena and her friends, like, at Eleanor's show, from the front row to the back row, but that backfires because Jenny ends up being able to make sure they actually walk in the show because Blair tries to sabotage her as well. Poor Jenny gets caught in the crossfire. Why don't you just claim your throne and leave me alone? Because I can't. And Poppy tells Serena, look, I think Blair's just jealous and doesn't want to see you shine. Serena is so caught up in it in that moment that she only sees it kind of in black and white, just like Blair wants to take the spotlight from me. Um, and you know, if you, she was a true friend, then um, she would want to see me shine, which is valid and is a fair point. But I think there's a lot more history to it that obviously Poppy doesn't know. And we as the viewers know, it goes so much deeper than just not being happy for Serena's success. It comes from years and years of this pent up resentment. I'm sorry. I was hurt, okay? You blew off our most beloved tradition. Just get over it, Blair. I'm just tired of trying to hold myself back so I don't outshine you. So now we're going to move on to the Yale dream. And Blair has wanted to go to Yale since she was a kid. And her dad, I think, went there as well. Um, so it's, it's a big dream of hers. And she goes to... Um, they kind of go on these, like, tour days. And Blair gets the interview and... She doesn't really do well. She's got still that perfectionist in her and is so focused on her grades and the kind of resume that she's built that she doesn't really let her personality shine through. Whereas when Serena goes in, she wows them completely. And the Dean really likes her and thinks that she's a big character and because she is a socialite would be a good person to bring it to Yale. Whereas Blair doesn't really have that kind of wow factor. So once again, Serena has beat Al Blair for what is truly her dream, ultimately. And I understand as well, because obviously Yale is a good school, anyone would want to go there if given the opportunity. But the fact that it had been Blair's dream for so long, I think the fact that Serena didn't even consider that for a second was really harsh. And I think this is one of Blair's most vulnerable moments in the show, even though it's so quick, because she actually states out loud to Serena, you take everything from me, and actually says to her how she like feels inferior to her, how many people in her life have contributed to that. Nate, her mom, like, she just waltzes through. And that's the first time that we really see her express that to Serena, like, plainly. Of all the things. Nate, my mom, the girls at school, you wouldn't take this from me. So to try and fix things, Blair schemes her way into the Dean's party where Serena is attending and they have to say who they would most want to have dinner with, uh, dead or alive. And Blair changes Serena's answer to Pete Fairman, which is the man that she thought that she killed, which was wild. That was so unhinged. <laughs> She was so wild for that, like truly. Um, and because of this, they get into a physical fight, like full on WWE wrestling ring, like 
it's there. They are, the, you know, they're out. They're out there fighting. I do pins with that chicken wing. Don't deny it. They kind of just come to this conclusion that they're just not supposed to be friends. Blair is like, I just can't stand in your shadow anymore. That's where we get the Sunshine Barbie, Darth Vader comparison comes from Blair herself. And Serena agrees. They're like, you know what? Let's just not be friends. And this lasts for, I think, about three minutes. Because then the next day, Serena and Blair both end up trying to go to the Dean and explain that it was their fault and to let the other person into Yale, which again is a really sweet moment. Um, and it's nice to see, even just in that second season, we were already seeing Blair trying to put Serena first, whereas usually she would have just tried to take her down, which she did initially, and then realized actually, I don't want to be that person. They see that in their eyes, they're gonna be going to different schools and not seeing each other every day and not being around each other is actually gonna be really hard. So if they just push each other away first, then they can heal from that and they don't have to go through kind of what Serena did in a way of they just completely were separated and lost touch and all that kind of stuff. If they just cut it off now, then they don't have to go through that pain of trying to make it work or anything. It's just so much easier, especially, yeah, for Blair to just put up that wall and be done with her instead of having to deal with the actual sadness of losing her friend rather than just cutting it off. So now we're going to go into what I have named Chuck Turns the Tables. Back to the Hamptons when Blair is about to leave with Marcus. We have, I think, potentially the most iconic scene of Gossip Girl. It's not like my favorite, favorite scene, but I think it's definitely the one that gets quoted all the time and that I see all the time. And it is, it is a good scene. It is, I'm not gonna deny it's a good scene. And what happens is that Blair is about to leave and Chuck asks her not to. And she basically says that she won't leave with Marcus if Chuck can tell her how he truly feels about her and basically wants him to say that he loves her and he can't do it. And so she leaves um, with Marcus. Three words, eight letters. Say it and I'm yours. So once they're back in New York and Blair is dating Marcus during a blackout, Chuck actually goes up to Blair's room and they start kissing and Blair kind of plays it off like, oh, I thought it was you, like Marcus, I thought it was you, but I think it's obvious that she knew that it was Chuck. Yeah, Blair ends up breaking up with Marcus and then Vanessa tries to blackmail Blair. So she recruits Chuck to humiliate Vanessa and kind of get back at her. His reward for this will be being able to sleep with Blair, okay? And she says this like it's his reward, but it's obvious that she kind of wants this as well, but she's initiating it in a way that is still part of their game. And it's not her just coming to him and saying, I want to be with you. He does this whole side quest <laughs> with Vanessa and actually likes her. And this makes Blair really jealous. And, you know, she says, I'm calling off the plan, but you can come and like claim your prize anyway. And he does. And when he comes to her room, he says, I want you to say how you feel about me. And she's like, well, absolutely not. And then it starts this whole new war that they've got going. And we see this constant, it's th like I said, the will they won't name, this constant back and th forth throughout the show where neither Chuck or Blair wants to be the one that is vulnerable or wants to be the one that like backs down first which is ridiculous but that's their whole dynamic right is that they both fear that if they're vulnerable with one another and they express their true feelings it lets their guard down right and the other person can hurt them or humiliate them or you know so on and so forth and not only do they not really you know they haven't done this with each other before but actually when you look at Chuck and Blair, neither of them are really that emotional anyway or come forward with how they're feeling to anyone in the show. Those people are just their friends or their parents or, you know, whatever. Whereas at this time, being vulnerable with this person is not only just being honest with them, but is also opening yourself up to be hurt by them as well. So after talking to Dan, he encourages her to tell Chuck how, he, how she feels. But then when he finds out what she tried to do to Vanessa, he sabotages it and puts this doubt in her mind 
So then when she does go up to see Chuck and tell him, it just absolutely just is a shambles and they start arguing and it, Blair gets really upset. Blair's just upset because she's like, why does it always have to be a game? Why does it have to be someone has to win? Why can't we just say it at the same time or just be honest? You were on your way out with the count. Did you really think I was going to say it then? Yes, but when you did and I wanted to die. And she leaves and Dan confesses what he did. And so Chuck like goes to see her. They kind they kind of come to this conclusion that neither of them are ready to be in this relationship. They enjoy the cat and mouse. They enjoy that intenseness, of the intensity, intenseness, the intensity of their relationship. Well, their situationship. And Chuck says, can you see Chuck and Blair go to the movies and Chuck and Blair hold hands or, or whatever? And Blair says, we don't have to do those things. And Chuck says that those are the things that kind of make them who they are. It makes their connection what it is. Maybe in the future. I suppose there could be some excruciating pleasure in that. So they decide not to be together. So then we have Bart's death. And while this doesn't really affect Blair, um, like the fact that he died, it affects her through Chuck because this really affects Chuck. After he dies, Chuck is grieving and he just pushes everybody away and Blair tells him how she feels about him and he rejects her, which just absolutely breaks her heart. And then at the end of the episode, he does like come to see her and they have this really emotional moment where he actually cries. I think he cries in front of her for the, that's the first time and they hug, but he ends up leaving to deal with his grief. He just leaves, I think he leaves a note, um, which again, upsets Blair. So then when he returns, they find out at the reading of the will that Bart actually left the majority of Bass Industries to Chuck. And so Jack uses this to sabotage him because there's a clause that basically says if he's unfit, they can get rid of him. So Jack plays into this and through this whole mess and this whole situation, Chuck is really mean to Blair and pushes her away. We also find out in this that Jack and Blair actually slept together during the holidays, I think it was, like while Chuck was away or something. And um, yeah, so that's another like thing that's woven in, but that secret is not gonna come out for a little bit yet. There's this scene where Chuck goes up onto the roof and he's like, I'm Chuck Bass, but nobody cares. And he almost falls and Blair is able to talk him down. She says that she does care about him and she does want to be there for him. And I think that is a really intense and emotional moment between them. And I think a lot of the reason why they come back to each other is because they are quite trauma bonded to each other. A lot of really intense things happen, specifically with Chuck, while they're in this situation ship and then, you know, eventual romance. So many awful things happen that they are so deeply connected on such a deep level that I think it would be hard to separate that or hard to find that kind of, well, what you think is a really deep bond with someone else when you've been through so much with this one specific person from when you were 16. Him being her first and then his dad dying and almost taking his own life and so much goes on that they are so, their development is so like closely intertwined. Whatever you want to do to yourself, please don't do that to me. I'm sorry. It's okay. So then just as a little quick one, we have Cyrus and Eleanor. So Cyrus is the new boyfriend of Eleanor. And when Blair meets him, she is like, again, we see that superficial side come out of her. And she thinks that this guy is not good enough for her mum. And she tries to get rid of him again, like she did with Roman. And then she realizes that he actually is sweet and he does make Eleanor happy and she kind of, you know, they make amends and she accepts him. And one of the kind of biggest bonding moments for them, which I do find really sweet, is um, when Blair did tell Chuck that she loved him and then he didn't say it back. She goes to Cyrus and she tells him and Cyrus is really comforting and that's a really sweet moment between those two and really nice to see Blair let her guard down and be emotional with someone who isn't um, Serena. Wait, <laughs> not enough. <laughs> Don't worry. It'll all be okay. You'll see, dear. So then we have the Yale dream dying and 
Blair ends up being waitlisted for Yale, but then she actually gets accepted when Serena turns her own acceptance down. Blair, she hasn't really gotten out of her self-centered life yet, and I don't think she ever once asked Serena why she turned down Yale, or the fact that, I mean, Serena didn't really want to go there, but I think a lot of what swayed her decision was the fact that Blair really wanted to go there, so she turned it down. I don't think they ever actually have a conversation about that, or Blair ever really thanks her for doing that. But then um, Blair ends up being given a B by Rachel Carr, the new teacher, which will affect obviously her grades um, and whatever. But now that she's been accepted to Yale, that doesn't matter anymore. She's already been accepted. Despite this, she still decides to haze her anyway and still retaliate by inviting her to uh, the opera and then, you know, telling her it's the wrong time and basically standing her up. And when she is sat there, she realizes what she's done and that she should go and fix it. So at least we're seeing a little bit of remorse from her now rather than just doing these cruel things and having no remorse whatsoever. But by the time she gets there to explain to Rachel and apologize to her, it's too late. Rachel already, the line is drawn and this lady's got a vendetta. So Rachel ends up reporting her to the school board and then to retaliate again, Blair starts this rumor that Dan is sleeping with Miss Carr and they are in a relationship. And then Serena ends up taking this kind of compromising picture of them, which Blair uses as evidence um, uh, to try and get her fired. And because there's this whole thing going on with it, they decide to let Blair's like hazing thing go because technically speaking now, in their eyes, she was actually telling the truth. She wasn't lying about Rachel. So she hadn't really done anything wrong. But then as they're leaving, she kind of says, oh, I managed to get away with it. And Harold realized that she's, realizes that she lied and is really disappointed in her. And I think seeing Harold be disappointed in her again creates that sense of guilt and that sense of remorse that we haven't really seen from her before. And yeah, we did see it with Eric, but he still had a tie to Blair. Do you see what I mean? Like he still had a tie to her in that he was Serena's brother and she'd known him forever and she had genuine love for him. Whereas this time, she's actually feeling remorse about someone that she has no ties to. She has no connection to Rachel, but she still feels bad for what she did to her. So Rachel then decides to get revenge on Blair by telling Yale directly and posting on Gossip Girl, obviously, I think that she had hazed her. And then because of that, her acceptance from Yale is revoked. So now we're going to move on to a Blair without a cause. So... This is kind of Blair's rebellious stage. It's short-lived, but I do think it's a really interesting um, phase of her character because it's a little different to... So obviously when she had slept with Chuck and Victrola, her kind of Grace Jones, um, this one's a little bit different because it comes from less of a place of just wanting to feel more free and less trapped. It comes from a place of now she doesn't know what she's doing with her life and this is the only time that we really see her not be sure of herself and who she is. So she does a couple different things. She enters into a relationship, well, fling with Carter Bazin. She steals from a store. Um, she, you know, starts drinking during the day and she makes a whole scene at this Vanderbilt event. And we get a glimpse of how she's actually truly struggling under this rebellious kind of act when Chuck and Serena find her basically begging this um, board of admissions member for like Sarah Lawrence, I think, or somewhere, I can't remember, to accept her because now that this has come out about her hating a teacher, no school will accept her. And yeah, they go to this Vanderbilt thing and she's just kind of like making a fool of herself. She's kind of burning bridges wherever she goes. And she goes up to the roof and Nate comes out and sits with her. And Nate is just the sweet he that, he that he always is. And she kind of talks about when did everything get so messed up? Like we had our whole lives planned and now it's all kind of gone out the window. And he's really sweet. He gives her like a bit of a pep talk and gives her the encouragement that she needs to kind of come out of this phase and start to reevaluate what she's going to do. And I actually really love their dynamic. I think it's really, really sweet. 
and I wish we would have seen more of it. They kind of drift apart after this season and in the later seasons, you know, they're kind of more grouped differently. They're still friends, but they don't interact one-on-one -on -one really, uh, which I think is a shame because I think their dynamic is really nice. So Cyrus is actually able to get her an interview with NYU, which at first she kind of turns her nose up at, as she always does, but then she actually comes around and appreciates that he was able to get that for her and she takes the interview and so she is, you know, gonna go to NYU. So then we have a Nate and Blair reunion. So after kind of reconnecting that day on the roof, they decide to give their relationship another chance in a really sweet scene where Nate meets her at her favorite place where she likes to feed the ducks and they kiss and it's kind of a fresh start for them. But then Blair lets that kind of more self-centered side of her and her more superficial side take over and she betrays Nate's trust when his grandfather makes a deal with her that if he can, if she can convince Nate to go to Yale, he will make her a bridesmaid in Trip Maureen's wedding and he'll get her on to like um, the Whitney committee. It's like, I don't know, some, some high society thing. Once again, we're seeing that selfishness impact one of her relationships. But this time she sees what she did was wrong and she actually stands up for Nate. And it takes Nate finding out about it, unfortunately, to bring that to light. But she does deny grandfather this deal and she stands by him and um they like make up and they're okay again after that so despite being with nate i think it's before the prom um blair gives chuck one last chance to tell her how he feels and he doesn't if you just tell me you know then we can just figure it out and he says that he's not, and it's just a game. He tells Serena, I do love her, but I just don't think I can make her happy in the way that someone like Nate Archibald can. So she attends prom with Nate because that's kind of, that's kind of always what she had dreamed of doing. And it's picture perfect because she had this whole prom book of exactly how she wanted it to go. And Chuck took the book and made it so that it was her perfect prom, which is really sweet everything even down to voting for her like 150 times to win prom queen and i thought it was a sweet moment because he kind of protects her from that reality that the minions are out to get her and gives her that picture perfect ending to high school that she's always wanted because even though it can be shallow at times i think because a lot of her life isn't truly picture perfect like with her parents and her former relationship with Nate and her friendship breakup with Serena that having those moments in her life that she can control that can be just truly exactly how she wanted them I do think is sweet when she does get that and I think Chuck being able to give her that for her final prom was a really nice moment so then as prom and kind of in turn high school comes to an end Blair breaks up with Nate because she has a feeling that their relationship is only meant to exist in high school and they work best as kind of childhood sweethearts rather than a serious boyfriend for her to enter into college with because Nate kind of shows a lot of jealousy towards Chuck and does these kind of childish things and I think it's nice that Blair is able to recognize that and recognize that she deserves better, that she deserves somebody that truly trusts her and that she can go into this new life um, at college. But I just think it shows real growth because obviously initially she stays with Nate despite the obvious red flags and the fact that he clearly was still hung up on Serena and she stays with him to kind of protect that perfect idea that she has. But then come the end of season two, she realizes that even though she had this picture perfect idea, it's not what is truly meant for her and that will help her grow. And so she's able to let it go finally, which I think was a really good point per character. So in the finale, um, which is one of my favorite episodes, I love it. Blair and Serena are having breakfast and Serena tells Blair, this is what Chuck said. He said that he loves you and, and all this stuff. So she is really excited by that because he returns her feelings. He feels the same way. And 
at graduation they talk and she's about to tell him how she feels but then she kind of chickens out again and during the graduation ceremony gossip girl sends this big blast where she kind of gives everyone labels and blair's is class weakling which then makes her want to prove gossip girl wrong by expressing her feelings for chuck she's like i'm gonna do it but before she really can gossip girl goes on this big like tip releasing spree and reveals that jack chuck's uncle and blair had slept together so now blair's moment to tell him how she felt is kind of ruined but she still does anyway and she still goes for it but he uh, rejects her and chuck leaves for europe so then blair is kind of try and move on from him and she sees him on gossip girl going around all these different places and she tries to not think about it but then he shows up and he says i went to all these different places to get all your favorite things from there and to tell you that i do love you too that's it i love you too and they have this really sweet moment and it's one of my favorites in the whole series and i thought it was a really nice note to end that season on that she finally got what she wanted which was for chuck to just say how he felt about her and to know that it was reciprocated so we're gonna go into season three and at the start of season three chuck and blair are officially dating they go through a little bump at the very beginning where chuck basically they barely they play this game where chuck pretends to flirt with a girl and then blair like catches them and that's kind of their whole thing and she kind of worries about telling him that she's not really enjoying it anymore because it could make them boring but you know she works up the courage to talk to him and he completely understands and i thought that was really sweet because not only in the earlier seasons do we see Blair struggling to tell Chuck how she actually really feels about things and be honest, but we also kind of get that callback to when they decided not to be a couple and he said Chuck and Blair go to the movies and Chuck and Blair hold hands, don't you worry without this game that we play we're going to get boring and that insecurity comes back up to Blair, but she's able to actually express it this time and Chuck reassures her that he loves her and they don't have to do this if she doesn't want to so then we have nyu so blair begins attending nyu and is shocked to find out that her status at constance doesn't really carry over and in fact vanessa and dan become more popular than her which really shakes her self-esteem and georgina's her roommate and it's just completely not what she had pictured her college life to be at all and she kind of has to realize that people there value authenticity and they value sincerity far more than they value the idea of a school that is run by an iron fist and it's something that she just really she's a real fish out of water here which i thought was a really great place to put her because you could have done that with like serena but it wouldn't have had the same effect um or you know anyone else from the upper east side blair is truly upper east side constants through and through so i think putting her in this kind of environment where she has to kind of learn that she's not always going to get her way and she can't just scare people into doing things for her was a really interesting dynamic and i thought it was good to see her kind of lose that little bit of um self-confidence but be able to build it back up in a different way and find her kind of like uh herself again but at NYU rather than Constance because she kind of goes back to being in that Constance headspace she goes back to Constance and tries to get involved with Jenny who's the new queen and Chuck's just kind of like you have to stop this now like this is too much um and I like that they kind of got that out of her system because Blair definitely did seem like the kind of character that could get trapped in high school and that would only truly thrive in high school so to see her have to adapt to that was a great point of character development for her so then we have her early relationship with chuck and in the early parts of season three we see really genuine and sweet moments from them the photograph is mine she stole my shoes they have comedic moments and their chemistry is just so perfect 
these kind of, yeah, like witty, um, funny moments, but then also mixed in with really emotional moments. And it's really enjoyable to watch. Blair's belief in Chuck makes him feel like he can buy the Empire Hotel and that he can truly go for it and um, pursue the things that he, you know, his ambitions. And in that kind of same breath, Chuck's support of Blair helps her pick herself back up, you know, after being knocked down at NYU. And he really helps her remember who she is and helps her move on from her high school self. A bigger issue between them arises when Blair uses Chuck as a pawn in one of her schemes because she kind of goes back a little bit to that catty um, high school way when she thinks, when she feels threatened, I feel like that is where she goes back to. And she feels threatened by Vanessa being chosen to give this speech and she wants to give the speech and so to try and get it, she basically offers Chuck up to this guy and is like, he's on some scavenger hunt or something, like, I don't know, some Upper East Side thing. And one of the things is to get a kiss from Chuck Bass. And so she sets it up that this guy is going to be able to kiss Chuck, and he does. Um, and when it comes out that that's what happened, Chuck feels really betrayed that she used him like one of her minions, someone that she just doesn't have any respect for. And that had she, you know, Lily says to her, like, you could have asked him for anything. He loves you. Like, if you needed something, he would have been there for you. But instead, you felt like you had to go behind his back. And once again, like we saw with Nate and the whole thing with his grandfather, her own selfishness gets in the way of when she has a really good relationship or even just friendship going with someone. So then because of this kind of mistrust that has been created, Chuck leaves Blair out of planning um, his new club opening, but then as always, she can't help herself and she gets Chuck's liquor license through Jack and it turns out to be fake. And while her and Chuck kind of work through this and they're able to spin it into a positive light, this then kickstarts another feud with Serena because Serena had is in her PR job at this time. She has all of her kind of celebrity clients at this event. And then because it gets raided by the police, it then makes her look bad. So now we have what I'm calling the girls are fighting again. And so after this party, Serena and Blair are no longer speaking. Blair then wants to prove to Serena that she has other friends. She wants to prove to, I think, Dorota, Chuck and everyone that she has other friends. She doesn't need Serena. So there is Tripp's election party and she brings this girl who she kind of befriends called Brandice. But it turns out that she's actually an escort and Serena has her removed. And so Blair in turn has Serena's client, Patrick, who she's kind of like fake dating for his reputation. Um, she has him removed as well and basically says that Serena and Brandice are quite alike because they're both being paid to be with these men and so Serena pushes Blair's face into the cake and it's priceless it's so good and this is one of my favorite Blair moments because it truly just shows how far her character has come because she expresses to Serena I'm tired of fighting like this you know, that I'm too mature for it now. I'm trying to build a life for myself. I don't want to go back to these high school antics that you keep dragging me into. And yeah, it just shows so much growth from her character in season one. And like I said earlier, how they've kind of flipped, how initially Blair seemed like the more immature one, the more petty one. And now we've kind of flipped and Serena is now taking that role as Blair becomes the more well-rounded and... Um, protagonist sort of character. In season one, she always opted for the dirty tactics. She always opted for the petty jabs at Serena. And she was always meant to be there to show that Serena was the one that took the high ground and the high road. But now it's the other way around. So then at Jenny's cotillion, um, Chuck traps Serena and Blair in a lift together until they make up. And Serena ends up confiding in Blair about her father and her attraction towards Trip. 
and Blair strongly advises that she doesn't enter into this thing with Trip and she just lets it go. And we end up seeing a lot of instances in this season where Blair is actually a better friend to Serena than she is to her, which was more of a rarity before. Um, so like, for example, Serena does obviously end up dating Trip and she gets really upset about everything that goes down in the episode, in the iconic episode, Treasure of Serena Madre. And when this happens, Blair offers for her to come to Paris with her and Chuck and that they could stay in her parents' house and they'll have so much fun together. And I just thought it was such a sweet moment to see Blair be the one that can just be there for Serena because she is in that more secure place. So you guys are seeing me in like truly my most just rawest of forms right now. I really hope you can't hear what the builders are doing outside. So before we get into the rest of this video, I do just want to say, obviously subscribe if you want to see more Gossip Girl content, pre lies, character deep dives, all that fun stuff. But also I wanted to know, um, there'll be a poll um, already up on my channel when this video is live, that's where you can go and vote for the next um, character deep dive. But I just want to know for like future ones, would you like to see a continuation of the Gossip Girl ones until I'm finished with those characters, then move on to a different show? Or would you like to see a bit of variety and, you know, maybe back off on the Gossip Girl characters for now and do one on someone else? Um, yeah, obviously at some point I will be do doing all of them. Um, but yeah, I was just kind of interested to know what kind of schedule would you guys prefer? Like literally going like... Okay, so we've done Blair, Serena, we're going to do Jenny, Vanessa, you know, and so on. Or, okay, we've done two Gossip Girl ones now, maybe we'll do, like, Spencer, Hastings, and then we'll do Gabrielle Solis, or, you know, whatever. Um, so, yeah, I'm curious about that. Let me know down below, and, yeah, subscribe and like and all that fun stuff. So, let's, let's, we're going to get back into it. Um, we're going to do a little bit of makeup, you know, just to make me feel a little bit more, <laughs> a little bit more alive. Um, so, yeah. We're on season three, so Chuck's mum, I think, is definitely more of a him storyline, um, especially in terms of character development. It doesn't really affect Blair's character too um, kind of heavily, but I still wanted to touch on it anyway, um, because I think it does show Blair's, like, how Blair becomes more selfless. Um, throughout the show, I think definitely getting into this more serious relationship with Chuck. Um, she's learnt from her previous relationship with Nate and not letting her own interests get in the way, um, which I thought was really nice character development to see. Chuck believes that this woman that he meets when he visits Bart's grave is his mum. And Blair actually wants him to come to this, like, dinner so that he can introduce her to, you know, someone that's basically going to help her and, like, better her, um, better her, like, social standing, right? And so she's annoyed at him for not going. And then when he explains, like, I think this woman is my mum, immediately she drops everything. Which was really nice to see because, like I'd mentioned, with Nate, she had that little bit where she was going to accept bribe, basically, from his grandfather um, to get Nate to go to Yale um, without really considering what Nate wanted. Whereas here, we're seeing a clear cut between her knowing that meeting this socialite guy or whoever he is is nothing in comparison to what Chuck needs right now as her partner and that she has to be there for him. I don't want to keep you from your business with this you're the Nothing is more important than being with you for this. She actually ends up being the one that convinces Elizabeth to tell Chuck the truth because she's not really sure if she wants to and Blair basically goes after her and says, you know, if you have any kind of way that you can take away the pain of Chuck thinking that he killed his own mum, it would be cruel not to say you didn't because I'm your mum and I'm here and I'm alive, right? Um, which is a really powerful moment. I really, really love that moment from Blair. But yes, obviously the Chuck's mum story does unfortunately lead into the ho- 
<laughs> lead into the hoe. <laughs> it does unfortunately lead into the hotel story and that kind of point in Chuck and Blair's relationship. So Chuck's mom ends up double crossing him um, in favor of Jack because she's in love with him and um, signs the Empire Hotel over to Jack. And Jack basically says that the only thing that I want in exchange for the hotel is Blair. And obviously she is like, absolutely not. But then she sees how much it hurts Chuck and she decides that she's going to go through with it. Again, I think we, oh, we're going to talk about this in like literally two seconds. Um, but I think this stirred a really interesting conversation about can you love somebody too much and the things that you are willing to do for that person because I think Blair almost went too far the other way, right? In that initially, she wasn't selfless enough and she would put her own needs before everyone in her life. And then we start to see her work on that and I really love that. But then we see it almost go too far the other way to the point where with Chuck, she at this point is willing to do anything for him. Um, and I think there should have been more recognition of what she was willing to give up and what she was willing to do in order to help Chuck. Um, and so she goes and she actually finds out from Jack. She doesn't end up sleeping with him. Um, he just kisses her, I think. And he says, Chuck basically orchestrated this whole thing knowing that you would come here. And so she's obviously devastated and heartbroken that Chuck would do this to her and would set her up like this. Um, and he doesn't really see it as that big of a deal. And I think that it's just really sad because not only did it show how much she loved him in order to do something that horrific, basically sacrifice herself for this hotel, but also it showed how far she'd come in her compassion and wanting to support the people in her life to the point that it almost destroyed her in order to do that. Um, and I thought that was such a shame because she was making so much progress in that and the fact that he just took advantage of it was really sad. All I ever did was love you. You said you would stand by me through anything. I never thought that the worst thing you would ever do would be to me. And so she ends things with Chuck. And honestly, I hate this storyline, I really do. I hate it so much, I think it was unnecessary. I think they kind of wanted that will they won't they thing back. And I think it just firstly took a huge sledgehammer to Chuck's character development, but also Blair goes through so much in the show and I don't think it's talked about so much because she is very harsh, like she's very cruel. And I talked about that in my Jenny Humphrey video. I think she's incredibly cruel to Jenny. She can be incredibly cruel to Serena um, and so on. But in that same breath, she does have a lot of awful, awful things that happen to her in this show. And this one, I think, just truly shattered her trust um and her kind of sense of what she wanted because she, also that she really wanted was Chuck and to make him happy and it got her nowhere he tries to win her back and by throwing Dorota this huge kind of elaborate wedding which is just gorgeous I love Dorota and Vanya they're one of my fave couples we see this really sweet heart to heart with Blair and Dorota and you get to see how much Blair truly cares for her because um it's kind of a tradition in Dorota's I can't remember if it's Vanya or Dorota that brings this kind of tradition to the wedding but they have to have a happy couple send them off into married life, which is supposed to be good luck. And Blair decides that she can't do it because she hasn't actually told anyone that her and Chuck have broken up and they're going to be the happy couple, but they're not happy. And I really loved that moment from Blair just being so vulnerable and she didn't try and preserve her self. She didn't keep the lie to kind of help herself because she didn't want to tell anybody. Um, she 
looked at Dorota and want, didn't want to jinx her wedding, didn't want to jinx her marriage. And so she pulls her aside and she tells her, which is a really sweet moment. And we hear about how Dorota pretty much raised Blair and just the really sweet bond that they have because initially it is very much a kind of snarky, kind of like sassy, the way that she treats Dorota. But then you see this really sweet, genuine bond that I think definitely has so much to do with Blair's character and how she is shaped, which is so interesting because at least where I'm at with um, reading the books, Dorota isn't actually a character. So they kind of invented her. And I think she brings such a beautiful heart to the show, um, even though she's just kind of technically like a side character. Blair realizes that you can love someone too much because of what she was willing to do for Chuck, which I think is such an interesting topic and I would love if they would have delved into that more and seen her speak to somebody else about it as well and just kind of explore that a little bit more because I think that can most definitely be the case and a lot of times in these teen dramas we see that but it doesn't get picked up on. We see people go to such extreme lengths for people that they love and things that they think they have to do but it's never actually called out that like this is a lot to ask of someone and you don't have to go to such extreme lengths to like prove your love for somebody um and that you can be kind of swept up by love and kind of lose you know like the whole rose colored glasses or whatever it is um that kind of concept of you can love someone so much that you would go to such lengths to make them happy and to keep them and the things you would do for them are so clouded that when you then take a step back, I think Blair really saw how far she was willing to go and she didn't like that, which is completely valid. I would do anything for you, Chuck. But what if that's wrong? I never thought it was possible to love someone too much, but maybe it is. Now we're going to move on to she's a Columbia girly now. So... Blair still doesn't really feel like she fits in at NYU, but then she goes to visit Nate on a campus at Columbia and she hears the girls talking about Gossip Girl and that they still read it and she pretends that she is going to be a student there. Someone overhears this and posts it on Gossip Girl and kind of exposes that she's lying and she's pretending to be a student at Columbia. But then it turns out that Chuck actually did apply for her because he knew that she wouldn't apply herself. Um, so he applied for her before they broke up and she got accepted. So she now actually is going to Columbia rather than NYU. So now we're going to move on to a post Chuck world. So initially when Blair first breaks up with Chuck, she has a really hard time kind of finding anyone that will go out with her because Chuck has kind of put, I can't remember what they called it. He like has basically put like a dating ban on her being one of the most influential and famous people on the Upper East Side, you know, and like the richest. Um, people are kind of intimidated by going out um, with someone whose ex is Chuck Bath. Initially, Blair wants to just get rid of Chuck out of her life. She wants to throw everything away, all their pictures, absolutely anything to do with him. Um, and then she ends up realizing that he will always be part of her life and their memories don't have to be erased. And that whole relationship is part of her growth as a person. So she keeps them and what she has learned from them, which I thought was really sweet. And I really liked that message that you don't have to have regret over things or it can be easy to say, oh, I feel like I wasted two years of my life, but everything is experience. Um, or as my dad likes to say, everything is character building. So I kind of had that same feeling, you know, you go through a breakup and you think, oh, like the things I could have been doing with my time or, you know, but then you have to look at what you learned from that, what you can take from it and how you can grow. And I really liked that part of Blair's breakup experience. So yeah, like I said, Blair kind of realizes that with Chuck as competition, um, nobody is gonna really 
approach her. She decides she's going to go to this Brooklyn party with Dan and be seen kissing somebody else on Gossip Girl. And then everyone will know that, you know, she is no longer with Chuck. So then when she's at the party, she does find this guy called Cameron. I think he's like a drama student or something. I can't remember. He, you know, kind of figures out what she's trying to do and is like, oh, do you want to make this guy jealous? Like I'm down. And when it actually comes to the point where she's going to kiss him, she can't, well, not that she can't go through with it, but she chooses not to go through with it, which I really loved. This for me is one of my favorite Blair character moments because I think it just speaks to her just so much and her growth because like I said in the beginning she's very petty she's very snarky um and she would kind of do anything to make someone jealous or make them feel inferior to her or show that she's one that she is kind of better than them and she has the chance to do that. She has the chance to rub it in Chuck's face. She has the chance to show that she's moved on publicly, that she is the first one to kind of move on from this and that Chuck doesn't mean anything to her anymore. And she chooses not to. She says to him that she's done with playing these childish games and she doesn't want to be stuck in that. And she, when the time comes, she is going, the first person that she kisses like after this breakup is going to be someone that she genuinely wants to kiss. She's going to do it for her and it won't be to prove a point or to show off or whatever it may be. It's going to mean something and it's going to be important for her growth and her growth alone. It's for absolutely nothing else. No ulterior motives or anything. It is just something that she's keeping for herself, which I really loved. So then I think she goes on like another date with this Cameron guy. He gets kind of caught up in a whole scheme um, and whatever, you know, they see each other a couple more times and it just fizzles out and we don't hear from him again. <laughs> um, but he was, he was sweet, he was fine. Um, and that brings us to the end of season three. So the the season three finale is truly one of the craziest episodes of gossip girl ever chuck still wanting to be with blair um gives her this ultimatum that he will be at the top of the empire state building and if she doesn't come to see him then he's going to close his heart to her forever she kind of insists that she won't be there so there's no point in waiting i'm not going to show up and the next day she keeps seeing signs that she should go to the Empire State Building and she's trying all day to for Dorota to just keep herself distracted and keep her away from the Empire State Building. And one of these missions, um, as I've just as I've just talked about how much I felt that Blair had grown and how much I was enjoying her character development, she sets herself back. Okay, she sets herself back. And she goes to see Jenny in Brooklyn. So for a little bit of context, Jenny had just posted on Gossip Girl about Dan and Serena maybe like getting close again. Like she basically posts this like compromising picture of them. And so Blair goes to tell her off, right? And it's Oh god, it's awful. It's genuinely one of the harshest things I think that gets said on this show. She's just so insanely cruel to Jenny in this moment. Like it's gen it is a hard watch, I find anyway. And I think I don't know, I'd be so interested to speak to one of the writers of this episode and see what they were thinking because I wonder if this was supposed to be like a kind of when she got rid of Georgina and that was a bad bitch queen bee moment i'm wondering if this was supposed to be viewed in that same light because for me it absolutely does not have the same impact i think it's one of the most awful things that blair does in this show she goes to jenny and she she tells her off for messing with serena and nate's relationship and that no one loves her she is like, nobody loves you, not even your dad, not your brother, absolutely nobody. Um, and you're just, you're never going to be one of us. You're not good enough to be here. And she's just, she's just so incredibly awful to her. And I really hated this because I think Belair had had such good character development and she had come so far from those petty jabs and and getting involved with stuff that 
It had nothing, genuinely nothing to do with her. Like it was all to do with Serena and Nate and Dan and Vanessa. Um, but she still had to like put her kind of two cents into it. And I just thought it was really sad. And again, I think this is another instance where she's taking this out on Jenny, but who were the people involved? Serena and Dan, they were the ones that spent the night together they like slept in the same bed while they both had partners like Jenny was not the one that was messing with Serena and Nate's relationship Serena did that all on her own her and Dan and but Blair takes it out on Jenny instead so anyway after this um Blair decides that she is going to go to the Empire State Building she does want to be with Chuck and she's gonna go but literally exactly at the moment that she decides she's gonna go Dorota goes in to labor and she has to go to the hospital with her and by the time that Blair does get to the Empire State Building Chuck has already left she finds his little bouquet of peonies that he was going to give to her in the bin which is so sad um and again i loved the moment between dorota and blair where dorota blair was like obviously worried about dorota and having her baby and was like I won't leave unless you know you want me to and dorota says that she wants her to be happy and she wants her to go and it was just such a sweet moment and obviously she gets there and he's gone so then she goes to Chuck's apartment or like suite at the Empire and she brings the peonies to show like I went, Duro went into labour, like I'm sorry I couldn't get there on time and he is like oh shit because we know that he had slept with Jenny. He's obviously shocked that she still loves him, he just thought that she didn't show up and then realises that it was all just a big misunderstanding but obviously yeah like I said as we know at this point he has slept with Jenny and Jenny actually tries to spare Blair from this and just leaves so Blair and Chuck briefly get back together they're about to go to the hospital to see Dorota and Chuck is about to propose. You can tell that that's where that's heading. As he's about to propose, he is interrupted by Dan who punches him. Yeah, he's interrupted by Dan who basically forces him to admit what he did because Jenny stood there and she's crying and he doesn't even have to say, Belair already knows. She can just sense it and she's like, oh my God, you didn't. And so they, she ends things with him again. Um, but once again, we have an instance of Blair targeting the women in these situations, okay? Because if you look at what happened, obviously Jenny went to the hotel to see Nate and she was really sad and she felt like nobody loved her. And Chuck was also really sad because he thought he'd lost the love of his life and they end up sleeping together. Chuck, in this situation, he is the one with the loyalties to Blair. He is the one that told her that he was going to be at the Empire State Building. He is the one that that needed to make it up to her, you know? He'd done this awful thing with the hotel, and now he was the one that needed to earn her trust back and earn her love back, right? He's the one that has the loyalties to her. Everything. Jenny, in this situation, yes, Blair and Jenny have always been kind of enemies, frenemies, whatever you want to call it. But Jenny did not do this out of spite. She was clearly so upset. She was just basically a little bit kind of traumatized by the whole thing and had just been told by Blair that nobody loved her. And yet in this situation, she does break up with Chuck, but does not go as hard on him as she does on Jenny. She yells at Jenny, she banishes her from New York and tells her to never come back. And I just thought that was so awful. Not only, you know, she just told Jenny that nobody loved her. And now Jenny's gone through this kind of like really traumatic version of losing her virginity to someone that she didn't love, but 
in that moment she just felt like she just wanted to be with someone and now she's being not only scolded from that but banished from where she's grew up and has been living i just always thought that was so insanely harsh so then after this blair ends up leaving for the summer her and serena decide to spend it in paris together have both being single and they just want they want some girl time they want to kind of refresh so they decide to go to paris So when we meet them in Paris at the beginning of season four, Blair has been kind of shopping and doing all that kind of more touristy stuff while Serena's been going on dates and everything like that. Blair kind of admits to Serena that her heart is just broken and she thought that she could ignore it and she could run away from Chuck, but it's just, she hurts in her whole body this heartbreak of him betraying her like that so during their kind of paris adventures blair meets louis grimaldi who um they meet in an art gallery and they go on this double date where he actually pretends to be the driver because he is like royalty like um he's like gonna be the prince of monaco or something and obviously as we've seen from previous instances marcus that appeals to Blair, right? So he wants to make sure that she's not just in it for his title and she pre he pretends to be a driver. And Blair kind of disregards him and is more interested in the one that she thinks is the Grimaldi, basically proving him right that she was only interested in the title. Anyway, she forces Serena to come. I want to get this Blair deep dive up so badly, but like everything, everything is just pitted against me. Why? These deep dives are cursed. The same thing happened with the Serena one. So yeah, she forces Serena to come on this double date with her. And while they're on the double date, she finds out that Serena is also going to be attending Columbia which Blair is not happy about. She was kind of looking forward to no longer being in Serena's shadow and that maybe they would And that maybe their friendship would blossom a bit more now that they were going to be going to different schools. But now they're going to the same school, all her kind of worries about how their dynamic was at Constance, she feels like is going to come back up, but now just at Columbia. So now we're back to the whole co Blair Serena competition thing. And firstly, not being able to stand that she's now going to Columbia with her as well. But secondly, on top of that, Blair believes that Serena is the one on the date with the Grimaldi because it's the double date. Blair's ended up with the driver and Serena's ended up with the Grimaldi. So she's just like, this is not happening to me right now. And she pushes Serena into a fountain to ruin her kind of chances on the double date. And Louis realizes that she's only kind of interested in the Grimaldi name and he cuts things off with her. Then Louis ends up giving her a second chance and invites her to this like, Gala. And Serena tells her that, you know, Chuck had been missing all summer. They've managed to find him in Paris, but he's willing to just sign over his whole life, like um, the deed to the empire, the deed to Bass Industries. Like he's literally trying to run away and start a new life. And Blair says that she doesn't care. She's got this date with this prince. That's what she wants to focus on. So Blair's determined to go to this gala. She's not worried about Chuck. She goes to the jewellers to pick out a necklace, I think it is, to go with her dress. And she sees this ring from Harry Winston and she says it's the most gorgeous ring that she has ever seen. And there's quite a few nods to Harry Winston. I think she mentions it in like the first season that she loves Harry Winston. And Serena comes in and Blair thinks that she's following her and is like, why do you, you know, I don't care about Chuck, stop following me around. And Serena says, no, I'm just here to pick up Chuck's ring. And it was the ring that Blair was looking at. And the detective that Serena is with says, yes, um, when he was robbed, this was the only thing that he wanted to hold on to. He held on to it so much that the robbers shot him. And this is when Blair realizes that Chuck was actually shot. And so she goes to the train station in her dress. It's just one of the most gorgeous 
scenes of TV ever. Like, just the way that it's lit and just the dress and the set is just incredible. Maybe become a person someone could love. Someone did love you. And she goes and tells him not to start his new life, to stay and come back to New York, and that while she doesn't love him anymore, she still wants him in her life. And he says that maybe her life would be better without him in it, and she says it wouldn't be her life without him in it. And he decides to stay, which is a really, really sweet scene. I really love that scene between the two of them. So then before Serena and Blair are about to leave to go back to New York, um, she tells Louis that although this whole thing has felt like a fairy tale, she has to go back to reality now and she gives him her shoe, Cinderella style, and says, you know, if you're ever in New York, you can come and find me whenever. So then we're going to move on to Chuck versus Blair. When they return to New York, Chuck brings his new girlfriend Eva with him um, that he met in Prague, I think it was, um, that kind of helped him after he was shot. And Blair becomes really jealous of her. She tries to dig up dirt on her and just figure out any way to prove that she is not good enough for Chuck, claiming that it's to protect him. Um, and she denies having feelings for him. She says she's just looking out for him, right? And so she does finally break them up by planting Chuck's passport in Eva's bag, which creates that kind of mistrust between them. But I think it was a real shame that Blair couldn't just say how she felt to Chuck and be honest with him. It was very, it was giving very much season one, season two, well, season two like vibes where, you know, they just didn't want to say how they felt because I wish that in that moment she had just said and it would have made so much more sense, but instead it just made her look really spiteful. And so when Chuck realizes what she did, he goes to confront her and so he kind of makes it seem as though if Blair did these things because she had feelings for him that would have made it different and then they could have worked through that and I think he maybe would have admit, admitted that he still loved her as well but because she doesn't say that it just made it seem like it was all out of spite and just to kind of get revenge on him for sleeping with Jenny. Obviously, I mean, I get why she lied, because she opened her heart to Chuck, he then, the whole thing with the hotel happened, then she was willing to forgive him for that, and then he obviously goes and sleeps with Jenny, um, so I do understand why she didn't want to just take him back, um, but I think it was just, yeah, it was a shame because it just made her look like the villain when in reality, I think she was in denial about still loving Chuck and also kind of unsure of what to do about her feelings and not wanting to admit it, not wanting to get hurt again. So I understand why she did it, but I think it was a shame because obviously then it made it, and you could tell as soon as she'd done it because she went upstairs and had a had a bit of a cry with Serena so you could tell um but I think it was such a shame that throughout all of this Blair is the one that gets hurt all the time and she is she does do horrible things um there's no denying um and you know things like you know banishing Jenny and stuff but the hotel and then even though I don't agree with what she did to Jenny obviously the whole thing with Jenny that is still gonna upset her and I think that's completely valid um so then to go from that to Chuck moved on with this evil girl and Blair's still heartbroken and then now he's declared war on her and it's just like the poor girl can't catch a break she actually can't catch a break so after that happens Chuck is just on an absolute rampage to <laughs> destroy Blair's life and declares war on her he sabotages her chance to be an assistant for this um I think it's like Martha Chamberlain or something like a, a lecturer that she really likes he enrolls in Columbia just to take these classes so that she can't take them just to be the assistant so that she can't be the assistant and brings Jenny back to New York to mess with her and granted Chuck was shot okay but that also doesn't excuse what he did and how he hurt her so her kind of willing 
to make amends with him and bring her bring him back to New York when she banished Jenny from New York and kind of start to have feelings for him again it just feels so ridiculous because then when Jenny comes back to New York she's there just for an interview okay she's just there to interview for Parsons and for Tim Gunn and she just wants to move on with her life she's not threatening Blair in any way but Blair is so incredibly mean to her she sabotages her interview she's so cruel and it just feels so like the way that she treats them both is just so ridiculous and again it's playing into like I mentioned earlier how she is a lot quicker to forgive the men in her life and she can be very harsh and judgmental and cruel to the women in her life so anyway after Jenny basically scolds them both and lectures them about how you know they used to be the perfect couple and now what's happened to them they're just going to end up destroying each other um and she kind of ruins their reputations by posting about what happened on gossip girl they decide to have a truce and this like truce treaty thing is written up by nate and serena and they decide who can go where who can't go where and all the rules and they sign it so dan being upset at what they did to Jenny, decides to get revenge and embarrasses Blair at her birthday party, trying to make her think that Chuck did it. And obviously this backfires, but Blair expresses to Eleanor how she wants to be this powerful woman, but you know, she just feels like a little girl. And Eleanor says, you don't have to lose the girl to become the woman which i just thought was so sweet i thought that was such a like good piece of advice that like blair doesn't have to because when she throws this party she invites you know the dean of columbia and she invites all these real highbrow people and i think it was nice to see eleanor say to her that she doesn't have to let go of who she is or the things that she likes doing the things that she loves in order to be this idea of a powerful woman she can be that powerful woman 100% um, without having to sacrifice those things. Then after the party is over, Blair realizes that Chuck is still there and they begin bickering and they end up tearing up the treaty and having sex, which kind of leads us into chair 2.0. So after they have sex, Chuck and Blair enter into a kind of friends slash enemies <laughs> with benefits kind of situationship, denying that they are in any kind of relationship and that they have feelings for each other. It's just, you know, hooking up, right? Um, and then Chuck accidentally says that he loves her um, while they're, you know, having sex and it kind of freaks them both out a little bit because I think they both feel it, but they don't want to say it. And then, because they're also worried the other person, again, we've got a similar thing going, doesn't feel that same way. So then Blair is trying to become the face of Girls Inc. And she needs Anne Archibald, Nate Archibald's mum's approval because she's on the board. And they kind of say to her, look, Chuck is not really good for your image. He's not good for your brand and you yeah you know that's gonna hurt your chances of being considered and chuck's publicist casey actually says the same thing about blair that blair's too good, kind of goody goody for his sort of bad boy image so both of them decide they're gonna take a little break from each other um in order to kind of preserve their public image but then blair decides that she wants to go to chuck's party anyway um and she this is the Saints and Sinners party, and they kiss, and Jenny, dressed as Serena, actually pulls the curtain down and kind of exposes that they are stood up there together, so everyone's kind of like, is this a thing? Is this what's happening here? And they decide to kiss and to kind of go down in flames together and be a couple again. Anne ends up being there and seeing this and disapproves. She says that Blair hasn't gone the job and that Chuck will always be a reflection of Blair as long as they are together, which she thinks isn't fair. She is her own person outside of that relationship, but Anne doesn't care. And I think that is such genuinely good commentary on how the 2000s was at that time. It was even just looking at like Taylor Swift and John Mayer, right? Taylor Swift had this reputation, which I love. 
I love Taylor Swift. Like, let's just get out of the right out of the way right now. Um, but she had this reputation of having too many boyfriends and dating these older men and all this stuff. And she enters into this relationship with John Mayer, who is considered the playboy and the bachelor. And, you know, no one, the media just spun it as this whole thing. And I was watching um, a really such a good, this is so nothing to do with this at all. But one of my favorite YouTubers is a girl called Ali or a girl like Ali. Um, Something like that. Um, Ali she she I don't think her name is. And she did a whole video on um Taylor Swift and religion and Dear John and, and that that whole thing. So that's a really good video, you should go and watch that. But that was a point that she made in her video that I think comes through in situations like this with Blair, that somehow John Mayer having this reputation and stuff is not reflected on him. The fact that he was 32 dating a 19 year old did not reflect badly on him, it reflected badly on Taylor. And um, similarly, you know, Hilary Duff, we had dated Joel Madden. Joel Madden was like 27 and she was 16. But who does it reflect badly on? Hilary. And she was the one that got asked all the questions about it and how, you know, like that was damaging her image and her innocence when we have someone who is literally preying on someone who is 16 years old. Um, you know, apparently they started dating when he, she was 16 and they only officially like came out when she was 18 or whatever. But how is that not reflecting poorly on him? What has that done to his, absolutely nothing. That has done nothing to his career, nothing to John Mayer's career, yet Taylor Swift still, I think it's getting better now, but was suffered the effects of how the media treated her for years based on her relationships which you just don't see as often with men. And I think that was such a good and interesting point to put into Gossip Girl. And I love this scene for that um, because Blair says that that isn't right and that's not how it should be. And she decides to end things with Chuck once again. I have to be Blair Waldorf before I can be Chuck Bass's girlfriend. I love you. I love you too. Because Chuck, benefits from this she he benefits from their relationship in the eyes of the press they want pictures of them together and even though they confess that they do still love each other Blair decides to end things so that she can become successful on her own she says that she has to be Blair Waldorf before she can be Chuck Bass's girlfriend and once again I love that she is so self-assured and you know in herself and who she is and her own success and what she wants to do and she's not going to let those kind of negative things impact her. But she wants to be a powerful woman and nothing is going to stand in the way of that. So then from there, it kind of shifts and we see the Juliet takedown. So obviously Juliet Sharp, I talked a lot more about in my Serena video because like Georgina, she was kind of one of Serena's uh, plot points and enemies. But Blair has a hand in taking her down. So and Juliet and Jenny managed to turn Blair against Serena by making Blair think that not only did Serena expose her and Chuck, but she also applied for the Girls Inc. job as well. But then despite being mad at Serena, she does drop everything when she hears that Serena's in the hospital with the overdose when they found her in the motel room, which obviously we as the audience know was Juliet and not Serena. But because Blair is worried about Serena, that she might kind of be going back to her old ways, um, she is upset that Serena didn't come to her and talk to her, like, even if they're mad at each other. I like that she reiterated that there's always that bond there and she does deeply care for her. Um, and she actually supports Lily's decision to send Serena to the Offshore Centre, um, because she's like, you know, if this is going to be as bad as it was last time and she needs help and everything, she's very kind of supportive of that. Um, and it does upset Serena when she finds out about this, but Blair explains that when she had her eating disorder, which, like I said in season one, this is kind of the only time-ish that we sort of hear about it again. There's one other time after this. Um, but I thought that was a really sweet kind of memory for her to bring up that when she was really struggling, Serena would walk with her to her doctor's appointments, make sure that she went in and be there waiting for her when she came out and was just yeah, there for her the whole time. 
Um, and I thought that that was a really nice thing to put in about their friendship and their bond. And that because Serena was there for her, when she needed her, she now wants to be there for her, which was really sweet. If there's one thing that Blair Waldorf loves, it is avenging Serena. So when Jenny goes to her and basically says, Juliet's behind this whole thing, she was having none of it. And she recruits Dan to help her, like expose that Juliet was behind Serena's overdose and like what's happening and you know, all this stuff. And so they go to Connecticut and they find her and discover that her brother Ben, you know, had a thing with Serena at boarding school and was her teacher. And then that kind of goes off into its own thing with Serena, Ben, Lily. Um, and that's kind of where it ends for Blair. But I did like that we got to see her kind of teaming up with Dan, kind of kickstarted their friendship, which then leads us into our next part, which is her friendship with Dan and her internship at W Magazine. So after the whole thing with Juliet, um, everyone kind of breaks up for the summer, I think, or spring break or, or whatever it is. And Dan and Blair are actually the only ones that are left in New York. Everyone kind of goes further afield and they see a couple of movies together and sort of become like secret friends. They're kind of embarrassed to admit that they're friends. Like they're like, no, we just happen to bump into each other. You know, that, that kind of vibe. So Blair applies for an internship at W and she ends up getting it and working there. But then Dan also ends up getting the exact same internship, which just hilarity ensues. I loved these two together, like as friends. I thought their dynamic was so good. I thought they bounced off of each other so well. They were absolutely hilarious. And for me, when they work at W is one of my favorite parts of the whole show. I didn't date Serena Vanderwoodson for two years and not come away knowing that those are Mark Jacobs and they must have. And we even see, once again, that growth and that development within Blair because she had always hated Dan and now she was being more open to him and that just because he isn't as, like, highbrow as them doesn't mean that he's not interested in the same things. And, you know, intellectually, they have a really good bond there, which is nice because she doesn't really get to talk about that kind of stuff with anyone else. And, um, yeah, we see that growth because she is presented with the opportunity to sabotage Dan um, which would make her look good and she ultimately decides not to and not to sabotage him which I thought was a really great moment for her and her character development but Dan on the other hand does take the chance and he sabotages Blair which loses her her internship at W. He kind of says oh but you know you got this through Eleanor you'll find something else and Blair reveals that she didn't get this internship through Eleanor she sent her CV to every single fax machine in the building and kept contacting them until they gave her the chance to interview for it or like just gave her the internship, I can't remember. And I, again, loved that. I love when they show Blair's determination and how she can get things without scheming for them. And I thought that was a really great moment. So Dan then feels bad, goes to Epperly and explains that it was all his fault and Blair gets her job back. I faxed a letter to every machine in the building. It's like 200 fax machines. 332. Then Blair sees that the kind of reviews are coming up and she wants a good review from Epperly, but thinks that she's too high strung and she's too stressed. But if she sleeps with someone, that'll kind of chill her out and she'll then give Blair a good review. So she tries to set her up with Nate and all this stuff um, that's not really relevant, but she ends up getting back together with like some guy she went to college with and she ends up quitting at W and gives Blair her job. So now Blair is working for W as like, to be honest with you, I don't really, I can't remember what it was. Some kind of like, I don't know, like manager or assistant something. You know, she's kind of leading the interns now rather than being an intern. To prove that she can do this job and do it well, she wants to set up an interview with Raina Thorpe, who is kind of a leading lady in the business world, Russell Thorpe's daughter. And so she wants to follow her around on Valentine's Day, kind of do like a piece on her and the magazine will think that's really good. But um, Chuck is actually dating Raina at this time and Blair says that it'll be fine because it's not real. He's only dating her to help him with Bass Industries. Um, it's not real, so I won't have a problem following them around on Valentine's Day, but Serena sabotage not even sabotages but she kind of just says to Raina look Blair still loves Chuck or like still cares about him and it's going to be hard for her to watch you guys on Valentine's Day so can you just like not do the interview 
so she doesn't and Blair finds out and is really angry at Serena at first and tries to get back at her. The kind of classic Blair techniques that we see. She's kind of in denial about the whole thing, but then when her and Dan go into this room, accidentally they get like trapped in there that Chuck is set up for Raina. Um, Blair sees that Chuck actually is invested in her and does really like her, which really upsets her because she kind of, not a suit, I guess, <laughs> She told Chuck not to wait for her or that he didn't have to wait for her. But I think part of her kind of hoped that he would and he wouldn't move on. So to actually see it and obviously he'd been saying that it wasn't real um, was kind of a hard pill to swallow. So then later that evening, we have one of my favorite scenes where um, Dan rings Blair just to see how she's doing. And she mentions that how she's kind of dealing with it is she's going to watch Rosemary's Baby. And um, he says that he also likes that movie and he has the DVD. So they play it at the exact same time and they watch it together while they're on the phone. And I just thought that that was so cute. I thought that was such a sweet little moment between the two of them. Blair ends up like losing her job at W slash quitting because it just becomes way too stressful. There's so many tasks that she has to do and Dan's really sweet and does help her with them. But ultimately it just becomes too much and she decides to quit. Then in order to see if there is more between her and Dan, they do kiss. For Blair, it makes her realize that she wants to be with Chuck. And Chuck also finds out about this kiss and kind of tries to sabotage Dan and embarrass him, which puts Blair off and she sees that he's kind of, yeah, still stuck in that playing games mindset and that he's not ready to be in a real relationship while he's still trying to prove that he's better than Dan. Um, so she refuses to take him back. And I love that. I love that maturity from Blair. I love that she can see that. Um, Cause even though she has these feelings for Chuck, she's not going to enter into this relationship again, knowing that one, he's not ready. And two, it's not gonna give her the kind of, yeah, emotional maturity and emotional intelligence she's looking for in a relationship and in a partner. Serena also finds out about this kiss, but, she, you know, they assure her it didn't mean anything and it was just kind of seeing if something was there, but that it definitely wasn't, even though we know that Dan's kind of lying. Okay, so now we're going to move on to what I'm calling the Grimaldi Strikes Back. So after deciding not to be with Chuck, Blair kind of goes back um, and is with Dorota and asks, when will I have my kind of fairy tale happiness? And Louis shows up and he has Blair's shoe. So he's come to find her. Um, so at first they have to date in secret because his family wouldn't really approve of her. And in order to kind of make his family believe that Blair isn't dating Louis, her and Dan pretend to be dating. And they kiss in front of them to kind of prove that they are together. But a picture gets taken of them by Charlie or Ivy and gets put onto Gossip Girl and obviously Serena sees it and it just blows up into this huge thing. So then Serena believes that Dan and Blair are genuinely just dating in secret and don't want to admit it. And she even tells Louis this exact same thing, but he chooses to believe Blair over Serena and they begin dating, which I really liked. I mean, I don't, I didn't, I'll be honest, I didn't like Louis. I talked more about that in my like Blair love interest video, but I didn't really like him or care for him that much. I didn't think their chemistry was great, but definitely initially he just seemed like a genuinely sweet guy. And the fact that so many times in this show we see miscommunication and we see people just believing things and running away with things and jumping to conclusions, I really liked that he trusted what Blair said to him, that there was nothing between her and Dan and just went with that rather than kind of rumors or gossip. He just took what she said at face value, which I really liked. But then Serena is upset and she calls Sophie, who is Louis' mum, um, and kind of tells her about Blair and even sends her Gossip Girl so that she can see all the awful things that have been written about Blair over the years. And because of that, she obviously disapproves of Blair and says that Louis has to choose someone out of her kind of pre-selected lineup to marry. And I feel like once again, like I mentioned earlier, we're seeing that dynamic shift where Blair was always the one that would try to sabotage Serena or her happiness because she felt like she was being outshadowed. Whereas now Serena is kind of thinking, oh, you like Dan might like you instead of me being the love of his life and you 
and now going to like off with this new guy to be happy and I just don't feel like you deserve it and she tries to sabotage it in that kind of petty high school way. But then after some convincing, Sophie agrees to let Blair come to this event and you know, so she can be considered at least, um, but it's almost ruined by Chuck who shows up and declares his love for Blair. But Blair is absolutely mortified and insists that she does not love him and that she was ready to move on from Chuck with Louis and was really excited about this. Um, and Serena apologizes. And Blair, I feel awful. Louis made me happy. Happy. Do you know the last time I felt joy? Chuck had brought me into his darkness for so long, I'd forgotten what that felt like. So Louis then proposes to Blair and because he overhears this and obviously overhears that she does want to move on from Chuck. So he proposes to her, which is actually quite a sweet moment. And she accepts and she goes to the Empire to tell Chuck that she is engaged which absolutely just kind of like enrages him and he says that she can't because she's his and he actually punches the pane of glass next to her and it cuts her cheek and she um, runs away from him. So now we're at the end of season four. So Eleanor and Cyrus throw this engagement party um, for Louis and Blair and Cyrus is such a cutie and tries to help Blair win Sophie over and help them see Blair in a bit of a better light. And Louis finds out, I don't remember if it's from Gossip Girl or somewhere else, that after just getting engaged, the first place that Blair went was the Empire to see Chuck. And he gives her an ultimatum of, you can come and meet me at the Constance. It was like a charity ball gala. I don't know. There's always an event going on. And you can come and meet me. It's basically mirroring what we saw at the end of season three, where Chuck gives her a similar ultimatum, meet me at the Empire State Building. But this time, Louis saying, meet me at the Constance dinner and I'll know that you have kind of let go of Chuck and we will be able to be married. Kind of just tell him everything, no secrets, no lies, and they can start their life together. Or if she doesn't show up, um, then they will just end it. Similarly, yeah, like I said, to the ultimatum that Chuck gives her, but there are some differences that we're gonna talk about in a second. Blair makes the decision to actually meet Louis and to go there until she gets a call from someone um, saying that, Chuck Bass is on the roof and he's threatening to jump and he's asking for her so she leaves the party to go and try and save Chuck because if you remember back in season two I think it was Chuck does almost um well he's like teetering on kind of you know almost falling off the side of a building and she has to talk him down and um I think it just shows how deeply Blair cares about the people around her that, yeah, like I said, with Serena when they were arguing or like now with Chuck when things are done with them, no matter what happens, she will still be there for the people that she loves and that love her. And so she goes, but it's actually a ploy by Russell and he wants to get revenge um, on Chuck. So he is planning to blow up the empire with Blair in it. So Blair is able to secretly call Chuck because she still has him on as number one on her speed dial and Chuck is able with Nate and Raina to come in and save her. So then she's saying that she's gonna go back but they decide to have a drink first just the two of them before she kind of goes off um, to get properly engaged and commit to Louis. And they end up going to this bar mitzvah which is a really iconic scene. I feel like everyone loves this scene. Um, it's really cute, it's really fun. And Blair actually initiates um, having sex with Chuck and they end up having sex. And then Blair decides that she can't be with Louis, that she is gonna be with Chuck because even though Louis makes her happy, kind of what is that in the face of this great love that she has with Chuck that's kind of undeniable and they just keep bringing each other back in. So they go to um, the Constance fundraiser and Blair is about to break up with Louis and Chuck sees that he was there. So he's still there. Everybody has gone home, but Louis is still there waiting for Blair and Chuck realizes how much Louis loves her and says that he gives them 
his blessing to get married. Blair then goes after Chuck and asks him why he did that. And Chuck says that after he gave her the ultimatum of the Empire State Building, he left after two minutes when she didn't show up. But Louis waited all night. And the fact that they both feel guilty for what they did, usually they're in it for themselves and all that stuff. We're seeing that character growth, not just with Blair, but also with Chuck, that they feel guilty about what they did. And Chuck wants Blair to truly be happy. And they say that while they'll always love each other, she decides to go with Louis and they get properly engaged. You're the most powerful woman I know. It's taking all the power I have to walk away from you. But I need to let you go. You need to let go. I will always love you. I will always love you. And then a week later, she is leaving for Monaco with Louis to kind of go and meet his family and, and everything like that. And we see that there is a positive pregnancy test in the bathroom that Blair and Serena share together. So you're not sure who it is that is pregnant at the end of season four. Okay, so we are going yet again. This is now the third time that we're sitting down to film this video. So hopefully we get a good chunk of it done. We're kicking off season five. And at the beginning of season five, Blair is kind of questioning her relationship with Louis and how much he is going to stand up for her against his mum and just all around feeling like he's kind of hiding something from her. But at the same time, she's still planning her wedding and Dorota actually reveals that she is pregnant. And make you think it was just Dorota's test in the bin. But then while Blair's getting her dress fitted, the lady asks how far along she is. So we know that Blair is also pregnant. So let's get started with Blair versus the Grimaldis. Blair comes pretty close to ending things with Louis. Um, and she even confides in dad about this and asks if he'll, if she can like stay with him for a little while or something, or if they go away together, you know, just to kind of get away from the press that she's gonna experience if she does leave Louis. And Dan is very down. He's like, yeah, of course, like, I'll help you, we'll go. And then at that moment, Louis shows up and he explains that he's been trying to keep Dan's article in. So at the end of season four, we see Vanessa take Dan's script for Inside, which is a book that he's written, an expose about the Upper East Side, and she sends it to a publisher. And so Louis is trying to help Dan stop that book from coming out, because if it does, um, it's not gonna be great for Blair's image, right? That's what Louis's been off, like busy doing, but Dan kind of played into the fact that Louis wasn't there and fed into Blair's kind of insecurities about it and then was basically encouraging her to leave him when in reality the whole time he was just trying to protect her and obviously Blair is pissed about this because she doesn't understand why he would do that but obviously we as the audience know that he is in love with her. So then we meet Louis's sister Beatrice who oh man is she a piece of work. Trigger warning now we're going to just talk about Blair's ED quickly just briefly in this next bit about Beatrice. She's like immediately got it in for Blair right and she thinks that Blair's morning sickness is actually Blair's ED coming back and that she's hiding it from Louis which she is so awful she's so awful she basically forces her to come to this feast and tries to give her all this food basically taunting her trying to make her eat thinking that she has an, an eating disorder when in reality the food just makes her feel sick because it's morning sickness but the idea of that is actually so messed up and I feel like no one really talks about how messed up that is. That is up there with <laughs> some of the most evil shit on this show. So when Blair goes into the bathroom to be sick again, Dan comes in and thinks that she has relapsed and so he is insisting that he's not going to leave until he makes sure that she's okay, which is really sweet. I did 
enjoy that. I mean, I touched on earlier when we talked about the ED that I didn't really feel like there was enough closure on that story and enough support for Blair. They just kind of let that story sort of fizzle out. Um, but I did like at least when they did mention it briefly that Dan was very supportive and was there for her and was going to do whatever he needed to do. Eating disorders can return when people are stressed. Clearly, Chuck is not the only one freaking out. But this isn't a joke. We are not leaving this room until you agree to get help. So then because he's not going to leave, she ends up just telling him, okay, fine, I'm pregnant. So now we've got the Who's the Daddy sequel, okay? Who's the Daddy the sequel? And once again, Chuck is involved. <laughs> So we have Chuck and Louis for our potential dads, because obviously Chuck and Blair had slept together at that bar mitzvah just before Blair agreed to marry Louis. But then she spent the summer with him. And she basically says that there's no way that it could be Chuck's because her and Louis have done it so many times but there's still the tiny, tiny chance that it could be. So she does the test, but she's too scared to look at it. So Dorota and Dan keep trying to encourage her to look at it throughout the day, um, which makes for some absolutely hilarious scenes between Dan and Blair, as always. Like I said, their dynamic as friends is just absolutely unmatched. So then when she finally does open the results, she goes to Chuck to tell him that not only is she pregnant, but that it is Louise because she didn't want him to hear about it and think that it was his, which is just so sad. Like, it's so sad. Earlier in the day, she had actually seen, because Dan gets Chuck a dog, he's called Monkey, and she had seen on Gossip Girl that Chuck had taken Monkey back, and that was kind of, I guess, like a little sign to her that if he was the dad, he was not going to be interested in being a father. And then... So then that kind of gave her like, in a weird way, a tiny bit of reassurance in, in being able to open the envelope. But then it turns out that he actually did keep Monkey. He like got him flea jabbed or something like that. I can't remember. He'd like sent him in to get something done because it's like the responsible thing to do. And in that moment, she kind of realizes that she was wrong. And the look in his eyes just tells that he actually would have wanted to be the father and she before she leaves she tells chuck that a part of her really wished that it was his there was a part of me that really wanted it to be yours i know that we don't like louis okay and we're gonna get to that but oh my god if i was this man and as soon as i proposed to my partner the first thing they did was went to their ex's like hotel had i mean she doesn't oh no she he does find out that she slept with him um had slept with them on the night we got engaged had you know gone and told them first about the pregnancy that my baby could have potentially been that like i mean <laughs> like we love blair but this is some this is some messy business so then she was a bit nervous to tell louis that she was pregnant because in an interview he has stated that he wasn't ready to be a dad yet but he actually said that that was to try and get the press off of Blair's back so that, you know, if he had said, oh, I would love to be a dad, that's all she would have heard about for ever. So he said it to protect her, but he's actually really excited to be a dad when she does tell him about the pregnancy. He's really supportive and it's actually a really sweet scene. It's such a shame that it's kind of all clouded by this because like... As much as I didn't like Louis, he was a really sweet partner for Blair, and I did love that she was getting kind of her fairy tale life that she had always wanted. We see it from the very beginning. I think Serena I don't, it says it like multiple times that Blair always has the best version of the story, you know, the best version of events that she is living in this kind of Blair fantasy world that she creates. And this dream that she was gonna have marry her high school sweetheart, Nate, that they were gonna go to prom together in this perfect, you know, prom setting, and they were gonna get married, and she was gonna be part of the Vanderbilts, and she had this dream that she wanted to be a princess, and now 
Louise here and he's really kind and sweet and makes her really happy and she's getting married to him. She's going to be the princess of Monaco and she's also going to have this baby with him and not only is he really excited to, he genuinely loves her, but even though she's getting all the things she's ever wanted, it still is kind of plagued by this feeling of uncertainty and not being completely and truly happy with it. And I think that's a really kind of interesting little message that they put in there because all the, that kind of be careful what you wish for, um, if you get, you know, when all your dreams kind of come true, is it what you would have actually wanted? And I think we really start to see that with Blair as this season progresses. So anyway, once they reveal to Eleanor, Cyrus and Sophie and Beatrice that this baby exists, there immediately becomes a bit of a family feud because obviously Blair's from New York um, and so is Eleanor. They want the baby to be raised in New York and born in the same hospital that Blair was born in. Um, while the Grimaldis have a completely different kind of idea of events. They want the baby to be born in Monaco. They want, I think, um, them to go to school in like Switzerland or something, like go to all the schools that they went to. And Blair is only allowed to visit, New she can't be in New York for longer than 24 hours or something crazy, I think it was. And if she does break any of these rules, the Grimaldis can take her baby away from her. They will gain custody of the child and the child will legally no longer be hers, which is just, I mean, that is just crazy, isn't it? So initially she actually starts to come around and agree to these terms and agree to move to Monaco because she thinks that all her friends are kind of ignoring her and not being there to support her when in reality Serena was just planning her bridal shower and didn't want her to kind of be tipped off about it so then when she comes to the bridal shower she's wearing this gorgeous orange dress and it's really sweet and she realizes that people do care and the Louis and his family are kind of trying to poison her against her friends and make her feel like she doesn't have anything left in New York so she should go and be with the Grimaldis and agree to their terms. And I actually felt like this was an interesting position to for Blair to be in where she kind of felt like she didn't have anybody because that's exactly the position that she put Jenny in last season when she had, oh no, the season before, when she had told Jenny, nobody loves you and all this stuff. And now Blair was the one feeling like an outsider on the Upper East Side. So that was kind of an interesting shift in dynamic. And also, this is where we yeah start to see the kind of evil sides to Louis just a little bit. Because he does sort of say that... I can't remember exactly how he words it. I'll include the clip, but he says something like, you guys aren't friends, you just want dirt on each other to gossip about and all this. Your friends know no loyalty. Each one rats out the next, and you and I get sucked right into it. And she says that to Serena, and Serena is so, <laughs> she's so confused. She's like, I just did this whole bridal, you know, shower for you and all this stuff. I think it's really interesting and a good portrayal of emotional manipulation because I think this happens in quite a few relationships and even friendships where if someone is trying to influence you to, you know, manipulate you and keep you in that relationship with them, they will try to make you feel like you don't have anyone else that you can turn to that if they didn't have, if you didn't have them, then you wouldn't have anybody. Because in like Blair's case, he's saying, you know, they're saying your friends are toxic and New York isn't the place that you want to raise your baby. You want to raise it with us. You want it to have, you know, the best opportunity. There's nothing for you here. All this stuff that kind of plays on her mind and almost makes her sign this and move 
and move to Monaco. So kind of running alongside this, right? So this, this bridal shower had a lot of shit going on. So running alongside this, we've obviously got Dan's book, Inside. And in Inside, Blair is referred to as Claire. And she kind of assumes that it's going to be a bad portrayal of her and she doesn't even want to read it and, and whatever. And when his book is actually released, we find out that he didn't write her in a bad light at all. It's actually the complete opposite in that she is the love of his book and he speaks so highly of her and is so clearly in love with her and includes an exaggerated version of events. There's a scene which I think is an exaggerated version of when Dan and Blair kissed to see if they had any chemistry or if they were into each other, but he writes that that happened and then they had sex. And obviously Louis is outraged by this. He thinks that it's true. He, all this stuff, and Blair insists that it didn't happen and Dan does as well. So Louis, kind of later apologizes for that, for not letting it go and they make up, right? And Blair is furious with Dan and she ends her friendship with Dan. So this is then playing into that idea that she feels alone. She feels betrayed by Dan, who is supposed to be one of her best friends. She also feels like Serena's ignoring her and she doesn't have Chuck anymore. Like what is, yeah, keeping her in New York. Another, so, the, <laughs> so you've got like, the whole thing with the baby and the Monaco rules running alongside. You've also got Dan and his inside book running alongside. We've got these all in parallel. Then we also have another one running alongside that, which is that Diana, I'm pretty sure it's Diana, has been able to create a website where you can see every single Gossip Girl tip that's ever been sent in and you can see every single person that sent a tip in and you can see who it's from, absolutely everything. It completely removes the anonymity from Gossip Girl, okay? So this website exists, Nate shows it to Serena and um, obviously Diana knows about it and Louis ends up seeing it as well and those are the only people that have seen it. And so we get to the bridal shower. Dan has not been invited, Chuck has not been invited. Dan is fuming that he's not been invited. He gets drunk and he goes to the bridal shower. Chuck tries to stop him and it's this whole, it's this whole thing, which was so incredibly unfair for Dan to do. He's so, it's too much. It's too much. We're not even, we're not going to talk about Dan in this video. Um, and then while they're all at the bridal party, the website gets uploaded. So everyone can see everything that everyone has ever written and Blair accuses Serena of doing it and she insists that she didn't, but it must have been Diana because the only other people that saw it were Nate and Louis. You can literally see it. Leighton's acting is so incredibly good because you can see it in her face when she realizes that it was Louis that posted this in another attempt to prove that her friends are toxic. So not only has this caused a fraction between her friends, but it also has made her realize and kind of start to see what the Upper East Side is doing to Louis and his actions. Later, Louis actually finds Blair's paternity test and the fact that she even needed a paternity test shows to him that she had slept with somebody else. And obviously he's gonna assume that that is probably Chuck. So then after that drama filled evening, poor Blair, I tell you, she just wants to be celebrated one time. Not one time has she ever had a successful party, I don't think. All of her Thanksgivings end in disaster, all of um, her birthday parties, I'm pretty sure end in disaster or she's been embarrassed. And this is her bridal shower. And once again, it's ended in utter chaos. So from that, we're gonna move on to another chair reunion. So Chuck has been going to therapy. He's been trying to better himself. And he goes to Blair and apologizes to her for everything. He apologizes for the hotel and for things, other things during their relationship for not telling her that he loved her when he knew that he did. And it's honestly one of my, fate again, I feel like I said that about everything, but it is one of my favorite scenes because it is just such good character development from him and such a big moment for Blair and her character development, I think, to 
hear that after so long and all the things that had happened between them to finally get an apology was a big kind of moment for her most of all i'm sorry that i give up on us and you never did that's why you're going to be an amazing mother you're always there for the people you love even when they don't deserve it you know that's never going to change it's okay if it has to the music in this scene, the emotion of it, their acting is just 10 out of 10. Blair now seeing that Chuck is trying to better himself is convinced that he can't. She is absolutely hell bent on proving that he's a bad person, which is so annoying. I feel like it's such a setback in her character because she couldn't just take his apology and move on. She had to prove that he was a bad person and to do this she goes on this mission to prove it's all an act and she tries to seduce him and he kisses her and then she feels kind of satisfied in knowing that he will never change but it actually turns out to be a plan that chuck and dorota set up so he knew that she was going to do this and then he was going to kiss her and that way she could move forward not questioning whether Chuck was the right guy for her because she's now proved to herself that he's not, he's still bad. So then as Louis continues to kind of go to the dark side um, and she's starting to see, you know, more and more of these things in him, I can't remember at what point he does this. Um, I don't know if it's already happened or if this is another thing that she sees him do and it's like, oh my god, I can't believe he did this. But he actually pays Chuck's therapist to try and basically make him evil again. Basically to try and manipulate him to go back some steps in how far he's come and to turn him evil again so that Blair will not want to go back to him. He also tries to embarrass Blair at the spectator party by exposing her and Dan as the most secretive couple or something. That's a whole thing. And that's also when I think the therapist thing comes out and Blair's just like, oh my God, like he's truly, this man is truly losing it. Okay, this man is truly losing it. So in order to make Louis good again, she decides she's gonna follow Chuck around and follow him to therapy and everywhere that he goes to basically find out the answer to how she can make Louis better again. He says that there's no straight answer to this and he says the one thing he did was that he actually returned the engagement ring that he had bought for Blair, which actually really upsets her. And when Chuck goes in to check on her afterwards, she says that as soon as Chuck wasn't with her anymore, he started becoming good. And now that she's with Louis, he's now becoming bad. And maybe it's her that she drags people in to the dark. And Chuck reassures her that Blair was the lightest thing in his life and that she could never bring anyone to the dark side, which I thought was really sweet. You were the lightest thing that ever came into my life. Your love kept me alive. I only want you to be happy. I'm just sorry it couldn't be with me. So then Blair goes to Dan and she's really upset about the whole thing. And she says that she really wants to be happy, but she just doesn't know how to anymore. And I just think that is such a like heart wrenching scene from her because like I mentioned, she's always been very sure of herself and the things that she wanted and such a perfectionist. And I think it really messes with her that she now has what she deemed to be her perfect life, but she's actually not happy with it. And she doesn't know what to do with that. And I think a lot of people can really relate to that idea of wanting to be happy and live that fulfilled life, but just not really knowing how to and how like how to unlock that for yourself. Is it what other people think you should be doing? Or is it what you always thought you should be doing? Or is it kind of the spontaneous spur of the moment things? Or, you know, that whole kind of, the kind of turbulence of, of the early 20s. And Dan says that he thinks he knows what will make her happy. So now we're moving on to the car crash. For this scene, we're gonna need a little more context because we've just got, we've got so much, we've got so much going on at once. So we have 
Nate is feuding with his cousin Trip over their grandfather's favoritism. Charlie is being thrown a big party to kind of make up for the fact that she never got to debut or whatever at um, Cotillion. Blair is being hounded by the paparazzi due to her relationship with Louis and that it's kind of, they haven't really been seen together for a little while. And Max, Charlie's ex-boyfriend, is trying to expose the fact that she's really Ivy Dickens. So we've got all this, all this mess happening all at once. I'm pretty sure this is like the mid-season finale. So Dan manages to get Blair to Charlie's party, kind of undetected because, yeah, all the paparazzi are following her. And he brings her into this room and he brings Chuck in to see her, thinking that's what will truly make her happy. And which is such a sweet moment. Earlier in the day, Blair had rung Chuck and had basically asked him what she should do. And he told her that staying with the father of her baby can't be the wrong choice or something along those lines. And he admits that he only said that because he didn't want to be selfish. He didn't want to ask her to leave Louis for him. It's really sweet. And they decide that they're going to be together. And it's, I just, it makes my heart melt. He says that he is going to love her baby as much as he loves her. And once again, we're kind of seeing that maybe Blair is now actually going to get what maybe she truly wants. Not the dream life that she'd always pictured, the princess and everything, but now she's going to get to be with the true love of her life, start this family, and and get to finally be truly happy. Because I'm going to love your baby as much as I love you. After Charlie, or Ivy, discovers that they're there, she decides she's going to post on Gossip Girl, because that way the paparazzi will hound the party and get the party shut down so that Max can't expose her. So Nate says, look, I've got a car waiting for me. Blair says she does as well. So they go down to the basement to try and leave the party undetected. And as they're driving, the paparazzi chases them. And Chuck asks Blair if she's sure that she wants to do this. And she says that it's always been him that she wants to be with. And they kiss. And we kind of think they're going to finally get their moment in the sun. A prince in a fairy tale wedding. This is all you ever wanted. You're all I ever wanted. I love you. I love every part of you. Nate's in the car behind them. And he his driver confirms, oh, I'm taking you to the Upper East Side, right? And Nate says, no, you're supposed to be taking me to uh, Winchester Airport or some some kind of airport. He says, you're taking me to the airport. And he's confused. He's like, oh, OK. Um, and at this point, we realise that Nate is not in the right car. So he's gotten in Chuck and Blair's car and they've gotten into Nate's car. And then he watches as the paparazzi kind of swarm them and they crash into a wall. We later find out that Trip, his cousin, actually drained the brake fluid from Nate's car, hoping to kind of injure him. And that's what actually caused the crash between... Um... Oh no. I've just had a realisation. I think maybe when he tries to expose them at the spectator party is after this. So yeah, it was all Trip's fault, basically. And... Blair and Chuck are both taken to the hospital where we find out that Blair is awake, but that Chuck isn't yet and it's not really looking good for him. So now we're at the royal wedding and during the accident, Blair had sadly lost her baby and she went to the hospital church to ask God to not take Chuck away from her to... Please God, you have my baby. You can't take Chuck too. And at that moment, the nurse comes in and tells her that Chuck is awake and asking for her. So she visits him at the hospital bed and she says that just because they can't be together doesn't mean that she won't love him. And basically she has made this kind of pact with God that if she sticks true to her vows and what she promised and marries Louis, that he will let Chuck live. So that's what she now believes. When Chuck is then released from hospital, he's obviously very confused by Blair's behavior because she completely cuts off communication with him and is now set to marry Louis. Blair tells Serena all about the vow she made to God and that she went to a confession to ask if there was any way that she could be with Chuck. And when she asked this, she then saw Chuck almost get hit by a car. 
And that was her kind of sign that no, she has to do it. She has to marry Louis. Dan had also known this from the beginning and is kind of supporting her through this, but she keeps going on these little trips with Dan and Chuck gets suspicious that they're seeing each other and Louis does as well. This is then when Louis kind of tries to embarrass them and like out them as a couple. And it's all very weird. Like, why would you do that to your fiance at the launch of, I don't think it was the launch actually, or like at the New Year's party of a huge New York publication. Why would you do that? <laughs> very odd behavior. But anyway, Serena and Dan pretend to be dating so that Louis won't think that, that Blair and Dan are dating yet again. <laughs> We also see a really emotional moment where Blair tries on her dress, but she decides that she can't wear it anymore because it was fitted for her when she was pregnant and she doesn't feel right wearing it anymore. I can't get married in this dress. Vera designed it for me before the accident. Now, all I see is everything I lost. I wish that we had really seen this storyline so, given so much more depth and love and the care that it really needed because Blair loses her child and aside from this initial episode she doesn't talk about it again she doesn't seem you know and obviously people mourn in different ways and they they grieve in different ways but I think it's a shame that it's never brought up again and that she doesn't have again kind of like with um before she doesn't have a conversation with really anyone aside from dan in this little passing moment about how sad she's about it we finally see her get a bit emotional about it and then that's kind of it and i really wish they would have delved into that a bit more because it's something that so many women go through and to see it in a big show like that and have it be truly explored and see blair talk through it and be able to work through it and heal from it i think would have been a really powerful story. So then on the day of the wedding we can see that Blair isn't entirely happy and Serena even offers you know she's like we can leave right now like it's all good and Eleanor expresses to her which is a really sweet moment between them I feel like by this point in the series we've really healed that mother-daughter relationship and they're really strong again which is nice to see and they have this heart to heart and she says to her you know before I married Harold uh, her first husband, I was really nervous. But when I married Cyrus, she wasn't nervous, she was just happy. And I think she can tell as well that Blair is not truly 100% in this. So Eleanor then goes to the Empire to get Chuck and she tells him that she feels like something has been missing all day and that it's him. So she brings him to Blair and you know he asks her not to marry Louis but she says that even though she loves him and she loves him more and more every day, that she has to marry Louis. There should be us in there and you know it. I love you more and more every day. If it's even possible to love someone that much. Oh, also there's a whole thing running alongside this where like Beatrice tries to sabotage the wedding multiple times, gets Blair like drunk at her bachelorette party. Basically a bunch of failed attempts to sabotage this wedding, but they don't work. So I feel like they're not really worth mentioning. <laughs> um, but Georgina films Blair saying this to Chuck and she gives him the footage and is kind of like do whatever you want with it. Serena then goes and tells Chuck about the pact that Blair made with God maybe thinking that if he knows he can talk to her about it and he can just talk some sense into her about the whole thing and we have another one of my favorite moments which was so sweet is that Harold is walking Blair down the aisle and she asks Cyrus to walk her down the aisle as well because one father is not enough and I really, really love this because like I said in the beginning when she first meets Cyrus, she's very superficial about it. She doesn't think he's good enough or that he's, you know, good looking enough and, and all this very childish stuff. And now we see her and she's grown up and her, you know, maturity levels are so much higher that she now is able to love and appreciate Cyrus and they have such a sweet bond. Fourth time that we're sitting down to film this. I pray this is the last time. We're at Blair's wedding and the priest asks if anyone objects and everyone well not everyone but serena and that kind of turned to look at chuck because he stood at the end of the aisle and he doesn't say anything and then a gossip girl blast goes out that has the video attached so now it's like did he post the video like did he send it in in order to kind of sabotage the wedding and it plays out in the in the whole church this clip of her saying that she loves chuck and she doesn't know you know she loves him more and more every day and it's just oh, it's horrendous a horrendous watch 
And so she runs out. Chuck says that he knows about the pact that she made with God, but she's like, you know, just it doesn't matter. And she apologizes to Louis and they, you know, she promises to never humiliate him again. And he accepts and they go through with the wedding, which when you're watching it, you're like, this is mad. Like, how is he doing this? Like, how is he actually gonna go through with this wedding after all that shit? And then while they're having their first dance, Louis reveals that their marriage is a sham. It's just for show. The video was the final straw and that now she's just stuck in this loveless marriage with him. From this moment forward, there is nothing between us but a contract. Our marriage is all for show. And it will stay that way until I say it's over. Which was so crazy. Even though it feels kind of predictable because of course he was going to be evil after all that shit she did to him. That moment when they're dancing together and you just see that like evil in his face, it's just like such good TV. So that moves us on to the runaway bride. So Belair asks dad to go with her. They literally go straight from the wedding reception and go to the airport because she knows that if you go to the Dominican Republic, you can get a divorce, um, just you, um, the wife without the husband being there, which I tell you, it's actually not appreciated enough in this show how smart Blair is because they kind of show it in the earlier seasons with her going to, like, wanting to go to Yale and her grades always being up. But I think she's actually such a genius and they get these moments where you see it come through and I just, I just love those moments so much. So anyway, that's the plan. Just their dynamic here is just absolutely hilarious. It is like gold, 10 out of 10. That scene with them in the airport is so incredibly funny. We're they're staring at you because you're wearing a wedding dress. Right, you have a point. They do give credit to people from Brooklyn, right? So I'm hoping that you will allow me to prove my identity with this. People start recognizing her and so they have to leave. So then Serena and Chuck find the hotel where they're at and Dan feels really like taken for granted by Blair and he leaves. Georgina followed Chuck and Serena. So she's there, she gets a picture of them in the hotel. And when this happens, the camera that had the video on it falls out of Serena's bag and she admits that she sent the video and Blair feels betrayed, right? She's like, how could you do this to me? Um, and she's really upset with Serena. Although we later find out that Serena actually lied and she didn't post it, but she just took the fall for it because she thought Chuck did. And if she took the fall for it, then Chuck and Blair could be together. Chuck is like, I'll pay the dowry, whatever it is, I'll pay it. And she's like, no, I don't want you to pay it. And Sophie finds Blair. It's like, this, this dowry is gonna bankrupt the Waldorf. So you either stick with the marriage for, I can't remember how long it was, she had to stay in it for however many years or you pay it and the Waldorfs are bankrupt and Chuck offers to pay it, but she refuses saying that she needs to do it on her own. And I, I really loved this moment of like taking responsibility from Blair because it was such a shame because she was stuck in this awful scenario, but I still really loved her determination and the strength in her character to say, no, I'm going to protect my family myself. I'm not, I don't want anyone to try and help me get out of it. I want to do it on my own. So now we're moving on to the rise of Dare. And I know that there are a lot of Dare stands out there. A lot of people that don't like Dare as well. I personally am a big fan of Dare as a friendship, but not so much as an actual relationship. After Blair returns from her kind of like sham honeymoon, she decides that she wants to get Dan and Serena back together. And she does this by forcing them to spend Valentine's Day together. She sets up all this stuff. It's so funny. Her and Dorota, um, it was, it was actually really sweet. Like the things they set up for them and they kind of trick them into having lunch together. And it was really cute how she was kind of determined to make this work. Um, but during this, um, Nate throws a Valentine's party, which I love because everyone dresses in their school uniforms and it's just, the vibes are impeccable. Anyway, and Blair basically encourages Serena to go because dad's going to be there and whatever. And so they go together and when Blair gets there, Dan is being threatened by Georgina because 
at this point, Georgina is Gossip Girl and she knows that Dan was actually the one that sent the video in. Not Chuck, not Serena, Dan. He was the one that sent the video in. And she tells him, you have to kiss Blair or I'm going to like tell everyone you sent this video in. And he, at first he's like, no, I'm not going to do that. But then Blair and him are stood there together and she asks him what would make him happy, which I thought was such a sweet parallel between when he asked her that same question, you have that where he asked her what she would want to be happy and she just says that she doesn't really know. And then now we have that flipped where she's the one that just wants to make him happy and she's asking him and he then kisses her, kind of showing that she is what would make him happy. So then Georgina gets a photo of this and which can be used obviously to threaten Blair with a dowry and all this, all this stuff. Uh, but Serena also sees, which I think is such a sad moment because she really had her hopes high that Dan was still in love with her. And then to see him kissing her best friend is just like, oof. So she obviously feels betrayed by this. And at first, Blair really tries to deny her feelings for Dan in a similar way to how she always kind of tried to deny her feelings for Chuck initially. Um, and it's in order to try and save her friendship with Serena. And I think we see that real dynamic where I do think that Serena is Blair's kind of real soulmate. She's the one that she's always cared the most about, really. And in that moment, she was like, Dan, I do want to be with Dan, but is it enough to risk my friendship with Serena? And she decides that it's not. Um, but then after she realizes how Dan portrayed her in his book because she hadn't actually read it. Um, it, it is really sweet though, I can't lie, it's really sweet. But he went to like a poetry reading or something that she did that nobody else went to. And I did always like that about their dynamic that he really appreciated the qualities about her that not a lot of other people did in the show. Remember when you won that essay competition and your mother was too busy to even show up to watch you get your award? Who came? even though you treated him so terribly. Dan came to that. Dan loves me for me. So then they kiss again and Serena sees again and she kind of forces Blair to admit that she does like him and she reluctantly gives her blessing for them to begin dating. So when Chuck finds out that Dan was actually the one that sent the video in, he tells Blair, but she honestly barely even reacts to it and I get that obviously she had other stuff going on she was more focused on trying to get out of her <laughs> horrendous marriage but again this is another like small instance of just seeing like she was so upset with Serena and felt so betrayed by her posting the video and then when she finds out that Dan was actually the one that did it she doesn't really have any kind of feeling about it um and she's not angry at him she just kind of says like oh what chuck wants is for us to be fighting which i get is a mature way to look at it but also you're in this whole mess because of him like and i guess yeah he was sorry about it so i don't know i don't know, I don't know how i feel about that one while this is all happening blair gets a new minder her name is este and she's kind of been following her around throughout these things like valentine's day and whatever um to make sure that she's kind of staying in line and Este confides in her that she loves Louis and gives her this weird plan to get out of the marriage where she'll get her divorce but she can't speak about the Grimaldis ever again and Este will go and marry Louis because she truly cares about him and Blair will be kind of a villain in the public eye but at least she'll be free of her marriage and so she's like yeah let's do it but then that turns out to be a trick by Este and there was no deal in place and then they the Grimaldis demand that the dowry be paid. Georgina then goes to Blair and offers her services um, to get the divorce because basically she wants everyone in town to owe her a favor so she's like I'll get you the divorce and the Waldorfs don't have to pay but you will owe me big time and Blair agrees to this. So initially Blair and Dan's relationship is a bit clumsy, it's a bit, they're struggling to find that kind of sexual chemistry and when they do finally get to sleep together for the first time it isn't good and I thought that was really like kind of funny, um, that whole dynamic because all throughout Gossip Girl we've seen that everyone just has that instant connection like Chuck and Blair, Dan and Serena, um, Nate and Serena, there's kind of that easy um, 
chemistry there. So to see a different perspective in a different scenario where it doesn't click right away, I actually thought was quite a nice perspective for them to give. So that initially makes Blair kind of question their relationship and if it's going to last. But then they do end up having sex in the lift of Serena's building, which again, <laughs> my gal Serena, um, bless her heart, um, which kind of ignites their spark and then they're on track and they're more of a kind of solid couple. So when Blair actually finally receives her divorce papers, she puts off signing them, which confuses Dorota and Dan because they're like, well, she could finally be free and she can be with Dan out in the public. So why doesn't she want to, why didn't she sign them straight away? Then Chuck comes to see Blair and asks her opinion on what he should do about seeing his birth mum again or, you know, Elizabeth because Blair was there the last time that she came around and with that whole thing. So he just wanted her opinion on it as a friend, but she thinks that it's a ploy to kind of bring her back in now that she's got her divorce papers and isn't interested. And I think that's such a sad scene. Um, and I get that she obviously did it kind of a self-preservation thing and she stood up for herself, which I do like, but I do think it was sad that in that moment, he was genuinely coming to her for help. So then Dan threw Nate, bless his heart, because Nate is always accidentally spilling the tea in this place. Um, he finds out that Chuck was actually the one that paid the dowry. So there was no Georgina scheme or way that she was able to get the divorce papers. It came because Chuck paid it. And I have no idea how much this dowry was, but it must have been insane. Like it must have been insane. So Chuck paid it, but he only people that know about it is um, the Bass business manager, I think, and Nate. They were the only people that knew. But now Dan knows and it plants this seed in his head that Blair hasn't signed them because Chuck paid the dowry. And now she's like, maybe I want to be with him or, you know, whatever. So he's becoming more jealous. We're starting to see that. Kind of like a similar thing to what Louis had in that every person that dates Blair is kind of secretly threatened by the love that she has with Chuck and that kind of eats into their trust and I don't know he just becomes very jealous in a way that I don't think he ever really was with Serena. Then he confronts Blair about this and asks her and she had no idea that Chuck had paid the dowry. She goes up to him and basically accuses Chuck of trying to buy her back like how he did when he exchanged her for the hotel through the dowry but he insists that he just wanted her to be free and whoever she chose to love with that freedom was up to her which again this isn't the Chuck video we're gonna get to the Chuck deep dive but the character development is definitely there and so she thanks him for um, I think she sends him a text later or something or like ends up thanking him for uh, paying for it. So then she admits to Dan that the reason that she didn't sign the divorce papers is because, not because she wanted to stay married to Louis, but because signing them means letting go of that perfect dream that she always had to kind of be a princess. And she didn't really get to enjoy any of it because all of it was so turbulent. And now she's truly giving it away, like giving the title away and everything. Dan takes her to the Met Steps um, in this big pink dress with a tiara and lets her feel like a princess. And these girls come up to her and like ask for their her picture. They're like, are you um, Princess Grimaldi or Princess Blair or whatever they um, call her. And I think that was such a sweet, sweet moment, not just in terms of Dan and Blair, but I think just in terms of Blair's character development because like I said throughout the series we have seen her perfectionism and how she wants the world to be a certain way and she wants to live her life a certain way and she finally got to have this dream and it was such a shame that it was so turbulent but then to have this moment felt like true closure from it and that she could truly move on from not just her marriage with Louis but also her whole perfectionist ways and the way that she looks at life in this idealistic dream way she's kind of accomplished it now so now she can move on to kind of who Blair Waldorf is next so then we have this whole thing that to be honest with you isn't really relevant um they announce their relationship at like a saloon thing or so like some British themed dinner party but 
you know, they just weren't really sure how their different interests were going to, how their relationship was going to work with their different interests and um, everything. But then they decide this is a kind of thing they both like. But it ends up being more about the drama between Serena and uh, like Chuck and his mom and Diana and all that stuff. So it's not really even about them. So we're just going to skip over it. So now that Dan and Blair are in their proper relationship, they're out of the public, they're kind of now past that sort of honeymoon stage and getting more into like the realities of dating each other and Blair sees in New York Magazine that Dan has been put as a highbrow um, person to watch uh, because of his book and um, something else I can't remember and Blair has been put in the lowbrow for being married for a shorter amount of time than a Kardashian. So this makes her really insecure and jealous which I feel like is a shame because I felt like we'd come so far from that um like in the first season where she was kind of jealous of Serena and that insecurity made her more impulsive I thought we'd really kind of gotten past that but we get this is probably the only time in this show where I truly cringe like Obviously awful things like happen in this show and whatever and people get embarrassed or whatever, but it's still entertaining TV. This bit I genuinely can't even watch. Like it gives me such secondhand embarrassment. I fucking hate it. So determined to prove herself, she goes to this kind of, I don't think it's really casual, but it's like a writer's benefit or something where Dan is going to give a speech and she goes in this crazy like, you know, elegant dress that's so overdressed and she takes over Dan's speech and like kind of makes it about herself and like introduces herself and it's actually awful <laughs> it's an awful watch it's an awful watch afterwards dan's kind of like why why did you do that why did you do that to me and she says that she did it because she feels like she's losing herself um and she doesn't really know kind of where she's going and she was so controlled by louis and what his family wanted her public image to be that and now that she's kind of free to do whatever she likes, she doesn't really know where to start and how to build herself back up. And there's this whole speech where Dan kind of reminds her of who she is. And I struggle to enjoy it, I'm not going to lie. Because even though it's a really sweet scene and the things that he says are really sweet, it just, for me, is too much like the scene in season one where he tells Serena why he loves her. For me, I hold that scene so dear to my heart. It's one of my favorite scenes in the entire show. So then to see them kind of recreate it here, but with Dan and Blair, it just doesn't have the same impact for me. So now we're moving on to Chuck versus Dan. So while Blair is still determined to find her old self, the good old Blair, she agrees to help Chuck and Nate find out what Diana is up to. And Diana has this planner, but it's all coded and... Um, Blair ends up being the only one that can actually crack the code, which I thought was so interesting. I really would have loved to see, kind of how I said in my Serena video, I would have liked to see Serena have more storylines that aren't just relationships. I think I would have liked the same for Blair. And I would have liked, like how, we're going to talk about it, but when she's more involved in um, Waldorf designs and when she kind of branches out into different things and when she was so determined to get into Yale like these storylines for me are so interesting and while the Grimaldi storyline was kind of cool and, and, and interesting I think seeing her excel at W or when she does these things that really showcase just how smart she is and how interesting she is I think those episodes are so incredibly good so then she and Nate and Chuck go to this brothel that Diana is running. And she even seems to get a little jealous when this girl comes up to Chuck. And they're kind of like scheming together and whatever. When she enters this room upstairs, she's the first one to actually discover that Bart is alive. And encourages Chuck to go back into the building to find out that he is alive. Which I thought was a really nice moment because we'd seen her dismiss him. Like when he asked about his mom and when that with the whole thing with the dowry. So I did really like that in that moment, she was like, this is huge and he is needs this and she still looks out for him. I, I just love that. I think Blair is so incredibly, I don't know if loyal is the right word. Cause I, th cause I think she has stepped out on a couple of her boyfriends, but, um, with her friends anyway, 
with the people that she truly loves, she will go to bat for them every time. And I do really love that about her character. So then she goes back to Dan, who had kind of been worrying about Blair and Chuck all day and what they were up to. And he's relieved when she comes back and she tells him all about it. Um, which again, we're seeing that jealousy and that weird kind of dynamic shift, which again, I think is such a shame for Blair because she's finally in a relationship where she feels truly respected and lo like loved and that, that she has good compatibility with, but he still doesn't trust her. And I think it's just such a shame because she's in this truly healthy relationship. But now, once again, the other person in that relationship is bringing it down. And he ends up telling her that he loves her, but she doesn't say it back. I love you. You know that, right? I do now. Come on, let's go. So we can, I mean, I think you could kind of tell that Blair didn't love Dan in that same way that she loved Chuck. Like even throughout all their scenes when they're supposed to be like really in love, I think she did like him. And, but I just don't think that it had that longevity. And like I said, I think there was much better off as friends. So then Dan is offered this place in a writer's program in Italy and he wants Blair to come with him but she ends up missing the interview because she is scheming to with Chuck to take Diana down once again. So she sends Serena in her place and which obviously Dan isn't too happy about that she, you know, just maybe just doesn't want to go with him. Um, but then she does say that she would love to spend the summer with him. I think at one point he even is going to turn it down out of fear that if he leaves for the summer without Blair, that she will get back together with Chuck while he's away. So then while Serena had taken over Gossip Girl and Blair actually just forgives her for being Gossip Girl and is like, I wish you would have told me like, and I could have, you know, gotten in on it, which I think would have been absolutely incredible. Like I, I've said many a time that Serena being Gossip Girl was one of my favorite storylines in the show. I thought it was so fun. I thought it was so different for her. And I would have loved if she had gotten Blair in on it and we could have seen those two acting together as Gossip Girl. I think that would have been just such a fun storyline. But anyway, while she was mad at Blair, I think, or something, she took pa uh, pages from Blair's diary and put them onto the Gossip Girl laptop so that she had that kind of insurance if Blair ever kind of double crossed her, which again, I think is a real reflection of how they swapped their characters over. Um, so obviously in the beginning, Serena is very sweet and she's trying to win Blair back and is a very genuine friend to her. Whereas Blair is the one that is jealous of her and kind of has these underhanded tactics and would sabotage her if it meant she could feel like the kind of queen bee. Whereas now we've completely flipped that dynamic where Serena was the one that tried to sabotage Blair's friendship and even feeling like she needed that insurance policy was really sad because Blair had been such a good friend to her up until this point. So now because the real Gossip Girl has the diary pages back, they begin to post them, which is causing a rift with Blair and Eleanor, with every, basically everyone in her life and especially Dan. Because there is one specific page that says, what if I never love anyone more than I love Chuck? So now we're at the end of season five. This was a very big season for Blair. It's a very Blair focused. Like how I said, breakout character. This season really, really revolves around her. Due to the diary pages coming out, she blames Serena for everything bad in her life and ends their friendship and makes her move out of the apartment. And then Eleanor tells Blair that she's actually retiring and wants Blair to take over as the CEO of Waldorf Designs, which I absolutely loved. Blair realizes that she does want to be with Chuck, but when she goes to tell him that she wants to be with him, we have a similar situation to what we had in The Witches of Bushwick, but instead it's flipped. Because in that one, it was Chuck being like, we can finally be together. And Blair was like, no, I need to build myself and my own brand. And now that she has Waldorf Designs and she's kind of made her own, she's going to make her own name for herself. She feels comfortable now going back to Chuck. But now Chuck is in that position where he's just lost Bass Industries to Bart and he states that he doesn't want to be Mr. Blair Waldorf. He kind of followed her all year, 
obviously ended up paying the dowry, but just tried to be there for her, tried to support her. And at every turn, she turned around and insinuated that he was a bad person when she basically forced him to, while he was trying to better himself, she was like, no, you're still bad. I know you're still bad. And tried, it was so on this, you know, desperate hunt to prove it. And yeah, like all the other things that I mentioned where she kind of just shot him down even when he was just trying to be a friend. And so for that reason, he says no. So then Blair doesn't give up on him and she goes to find him in Monte Carlo. Um, and she basically says that she's not being against him and she's all in and she wants to be with him, um, which is really sweet. I do really like that scene. I think it's really fun. And I love how she looks in it, the dress is insanely gorgeous. You said I always bet against you, but this time I'm all in. So now we're on to the final season, season six. And we begin season six with Blair in Paris and she's kind of running Waldorf designs and talking about um, what she wants the spring collection, I think it is, um, to be. First storyline of season six, which I'm gonna call Desperately Seeking Serena. And after ending her friendship with her, the gang kind of realized that no one has heard from her all summer. And so they go on this mission to find her and Blair apologizes for what happened and that she shouldn't have been so harsh. She still loves her and she wished that she had come to her about everything that was going on. She apologizes, but Serena doesn't accept it. And she says, you know, Blair kind of makes this speech about how They've been fighting for so long, they're kind of just stuck with each other now. And Serena says that she doesn't want to be stuck with Blair. She just wants to move on to her new life with Stephen, who is the guy that she's seeing. The Gossip Girl voiceover says something that I think is so good. I think it is honestly... I'm, I feel like I say this for everything. I'm going to do a whole video about it. But <laughs> the Gossip Girl voiceover says, Poor B looks like she just got dumped by the love of her life and we're not talking about Chuck or Dan. And I honestly think this is so true. It's like that thing that Jack says. Is it Jack? Yeah, I think it's Jack. And he says, Nothing turns Chuck Bass upside down like losing Blair Waldorf or something like that. And I think the same is true for Blair, but it's losing Serena Vanderwoodson. There are so many points in this show where... And I think it gets kind of overlooked because they are kind of frenemies. But Blair has always loved Serena. She's always loved her. And I think at points, even though it came from a place of insecurity, even in those moments, she still always loved her. And like obviously thought so much of her in order to be jealous of her. I think it just kind of came out wrong as it would with like teenagers that are competing in this crazy socialite high school world but I think Serena even though I think Serena is painted to be the better friend especially in the first season well I guess she did sleep with her boyfriend but she's you know she seems to be trying whereas Belair is kind of painted as that antagonist where you're supposed to be like just give her a chance like you know whatever but I think that Throughout this show, Blair is the better friend. She has moments of being a very bad friend, like she does. But I think she so wholeheartedly was in that friendship with Serena and always kind of throughout the show, we see these moments where she truly goes to bat for her. And like when Serena left for boarding school or when at the end of the series, when she thinks that Serena's gonna leave to move to LA and anytime that Serena is in danger, she's always there and she always, you can tell that she just feels that so deeply in a way that losing Nate, losing, I think losing Chuck is definitely the closest that they've come, but like, you know, losing her friendship with Dan, nothing ever really truly gets her in the way that a rift in her friendship with Serena does. It changes her whole character. You could tell the moments when they aren't friends how her character shifts. And I think that's really interesting. So then we have the chair packed. So we find out that what happened was Blair and Chuck decided not to be together until Blair has succeeded with Waldorf Designs and Chuck has defeated Bart. But he's given her the Harry Winston engagement ring. Oh my gosh. And so she wears it on a necklace and that one day they will be together. And Dan is really, really horrible to her, which I think is such a shame because like, I understand that 
he was hurt by the fact that she had chosen Shark over him. But also, Dan slept with Serena before her and he and Blair had even broken up. He was constantly, you know, questioning her and not trusting her. But at the end of the day, it was just... I don't know, I just feel like it Loki wasn't that deep. Like <laughs> I get that he was in love with her and it would be heartbreaking, but the fact that he just turns into this kind of like evil, resentful person towards her, I just think was really harsh considering everything they had been through together as friends and everything they'd supported each other through. For him to then just turn around and be horrible to her saying that he could maybe handle that she chose Chuck, but just choosing the idea of Chuck over him was what really got to him and Chuck will never be with her and that ring will never be on your finger and all this stuff. It's just so, I don't know, it was just so brutal. And I just really felt for her in that moment because Dan, even though, yes, they went through this horrible breakup, Dan was one of the true people in the show that really saw her. So for him to then be so cruel to her was really upsetting I think. But then we move on to a very brief reconciliation. So Dan comes to Blair when he has nowhere to live because he's burned all his bridges and she agrees to let him stay there and he decides that he wants to win her back and takes her to Cotillion and that scene where she kind of like comes down the steps and he's looking up gave me such season one Serena and Dan vibes where he looks up at her and she's in the gold like before their first date and he's determined to win her back and Georgina is like, bruh, like, let it go. And that's what I'm like. I'm like, dude, like, come on. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why season six for me wasn't as effective as it could have been. Firstly, because it only had 10 episodes and not 24. But also because Dan's still being in love with Blair and wanting to win her back in, like, episode five or wherever we're at now, like, episode four, just makes the whole ending, it just feels so rushed to me. It feels so rushed. But yeah, so Blair schemes with Sage to delay Serena's proposal in order to get Sage to wear her dress, a cotillion. Um, but she comes clean to Serena and they make up, which is really, really sweet. And Blair says that she wants to be a bridesmaid. And it was so nice. We were finally, they were finally s &B again. But then both of these reconciliations between Dan and Blair and Blair and Serena are short-lived when Sage plays their sex tape in front of everyone. So when they had sex, the night that Blair had chosen to be with Chuck, but he was, you know, before she did anything with Chuck, she wanted to tell Dan first that it was over. But before Dan even knew that, and him and Blair were still together, he sleeps with Serena. And she had filmed it. So this gets played in front of everyone, and... Dan tries to defend his actions to her, but she's not having it. And I absolutely loved it, okay? I absolutely loved it because she is just so, she is so sure of herself. She is so sure of what she deserves and that this is not what she deserves. And she says that she would rather be with no one than with him. And I just loved it. It was just, she was so, she was so good. I was like, yes, queen, okay? Yes. You ended up with no one. That ring around your neck is never gonna be on your finger. I would rather be with no one than with you. Because what did she what did she say all the way back in season two? The only thing worse than being with Dan Humphrey is mourning Dan Humphrey. Then we have Waldorf Designs, which for me is one of my personal favorite Blair stories. Um, it's kind of short-lived, but I just really love it. So Blair initially is kind of struggling to find her footing with Waldorf Designs. Firstly, because Poppy Lifton ends up using the exact same fabric as her. Then she finds out that Nelly Yuki is the women's wear daily editor, and obviously Nelly Yuki hates her guts. And she tries to kind of scheme against both of them, and it completely backfires and just kind of makes her look bad because at your age, Queen, like <laughs> you shouldn't be having to scheme to make your business successful, right? And that's the kind of dynamic that she's having to learn is that this isn't constant. It's kind of like when she went to NYU, she's kind of having to learn this isn't constant, that she can't control it all how she wants to. And she has to adapt and learn to be a businesswoman in this new, completely new world to her. Then she has her first fashion show, which she is so incredibly stressed that she actually like passes out, I think. And she becomes um, like sick. So Chuck takes over and he makes it absolutely perfect. But then this is ultimately ruined by Sage, who like 
basically strips down to her underwear on stage to like shock Steven and like try and ruin his relationship with Serena. So then Blair, bless her heart, is her show's been ruined. <laughs> her show's been ruined. And Serena is so horrible to her about it when Sage was the one that ruined it. And Paul Blair is just like, I was trying to do you a favor. Like, <laughs> come on now. So then Blair obviously goes on to design Sage's cotillion dress, which is considered a bit more sort of provocative than a normal cotillion dress. But Eleanor doesn't like the promiscuity she is bringing to the brand and how she keeps trying to get her way by scheming so she kind of demotes her and takes back the presidency so then in amongst this while all this is happening and she's got all this with Walt Disney Science Dan posts his chapter on her because Dan is posting a series of chapters called Inside Out where he actually names every person each person has their own chapter and it's kind of like an expose on them so Blair's chapter gets posted and she confronts him about it telling him that she will ruin his life if he doesn't fix it Do you hear yourself you're trying to bully me into retracting an article about you being a bully. No! Where you tracked me down with your spotted map and threatened me with the return of Vanessa. You are not mature, polite, or professional. So his whole chapter is basically about her be still being a high school bully. So yeah, she says that she'll ruin him, she'll bring Vanessa back or, you know, whatever. And he's like, do you hear yourself? You sound like exactly how you did in high school. And while I think, you know, I do agree with what he's saying i completely agree with what he's saying but i think it would have been way better suited before all of blair's character development right because i've talked before about the character regression in, regression in gossip girl and i think it's such i it just oh, it just really gets to me because blair's has to just be one of the worst with reverting back to her old high school days because blair from season one is very similar to Blair in season six, but there was so much growth and depth to her character throughout that, her friendship with Dan and her, you know, getting married and, and all this stuff. And then we come to season six and she's kind of reverted back and she's spiteful again and she's scheming and all this stuff that I just don't, like when she thinks that Dan isn't good enough for Serena again, it's like, you're literally just watching season one again. And so I completely agree with this, but I just kind of wish that it was different. Like, I agree with what he's saying, that she does act like a high school bully, but I think it's annoying because she didn't in the, like, in the middle. She always had that kind of side to her character, which I liked because it was the kind of essence of her that they kept throughout the season. But the way they developed her character seemed like all of it was a little bit for nothing when what he wrote about her was that she was a high school bully when for so much throughout the season she'd become so much more than that. So then at the art benefit um, evening, Blair invites Nellie to watch her resign from Waldorf Designs while Eleanor's there, kind of saying that she has no talent and everything that she comes comes from scheming. Which again, I liked this moment. I liked this kind of growth from her and that she was able to um, admit where she was wrong. But... I just don't think that's true <laughs> in the things that we see from her, like when she work, wanted to work at W and she applied and she sent f the, her CV to every fax machine in the building. She didn't get that through scheming. She had worked hard for these things. Like when it was in Colombia, you know, obviously she wanted to go there. She didn't get into that secret club by scheming. She didn't, you know, there's been moments throughout the show that aren't just centered around her ability to scheme and that I do think she has talent and I think the true Blair Waldorf knows that she has talent so it just felt like a bit of a weird a weird moment from her so then while she's sitting on the Met steps Nelly comes up to her to kind of rub salt into the wound but Blair this then actually gives Blair an idea um to create a line based off of her concert school uniform because Nelly's kind of saying how you were the queen bee in high school but now look at you and Blair's like, you know what, you're right, I was the queen bee in high school, everyone wanted to dress like me, so maybe I take that and I bring it into something new for Waldorf Designs. The person no one cares about anymore is you. Then why are you still sitting below me on the steps? Blair then goes to Eleanor and tells her that she made a mistake in quitting and that rather than just trying to be Eleanor and perfectly replicate what she already has with Waldorf Designs. She wants to take her own power and her own talent and the things that she is good at to build a new 
um, future for Waldorf designs and the people that are going to wear those clothes. She says that she wants to make a line based on the Constance uniforms and that the girls that wear them are going to be the new trendsetters and the new it girls, just like how she used to influence the girls when she was dressed, you know, as the queen bee and she had the headbands and everything. And Serena had that same kind of influence and that same kind of impact. And together they had the mini Blair and the mini Serena that would kind of follow everything that they did. And she wants to harness that and use that to push Waldorf designs like further into the future, which I think is a really good callback to kind of how Jenny spoke about Waldorf designs in season two, where she said that she was as, you know, the younger person in the team was the only one that was really designing anything that the buyers wanted to see and that Eleanor was kind of set in the past. So now for Blair, a few seasons later, to be bringing that up as a way for her to take what she knows and bring Waldorf Designs forward as the new CEO, I thought was really good. So Serena goes to Blair to make amends and offers to help trick Sage into coming to Blair's opening um, with the other kind of queen bees from the Upper East Side schools, which is a really fun thing to see. She does this so that she can kind of get back into Blair's good graces and they can be friends again. Um, and initially it kind of backfires, but then when the girls show up, they actually fall in love with the clothes and Blair ends up launching B for Waldorf, which is so fun. I love the line. I think it is so cool. I wish somebody made a line like this. And it's a huge success and everybody loves it. And she and Serena make up. And it's really nice to see Blair succeeding on her own merit and truly being able to thrive, especially in a storyline that's not centered around relationships. I have always known that I had the most brilliant, talented best friend, but now the whole world gets to know too. I really missed you. I missed you too, B. So then we have a revenge of the Waldorf. So despite Serena and Blair making up, Blair still disapproves of Dan and Serena dating and thinks that, you know, he isn't good enough for her, which surprise, surprise, is exactly what happened in season one. It's like in that time, Blair has been very close friends with Dan, like even closer than she was with Serena at some points, dated him and now has suddenly decided that he's not good enough. It's just so, it's like, do you even, like, did they, did they even remember what had happened in the previous seasons when they wrote her to suddenly hate him again? I get that she could think he did this horrible thing, but at the end of the day, he kind of did that horrible thing with Serena, so then surely they're kind of perfect for each other. So meanwhile, Chuck kind of starts to give up on his mission to take Bart down because it's just not working. Everything that he has tried, Bart is just one step ahead of him. And Blair refuses and says, look, we are going to keep doing this and we're going to go to war together. And if we work together, not date, but just work together, now that Waldorf Designs is kind of thriving, we can get to this goal that much quicker and we can be together that much quicker. So anyway, a couple other things happen. They go on a couple different missions and schemes together. And Bart tells Chuck to leave forever by threatening Blair. He just, I think he just takes her in like the car or sends one of his cars to go and get her and he drops her off um, and basically says to Chuck that the only reason that she is fine this time is because I allowed her to be. So he was gonna hurt her if Chuck didn't leave. So he has to say goodbye to her before getting on the plane and he flies, he you know gets on the plane and he leaves and Blair decides that she's going to form an army <laughs> of Serena, Georgina, Ivy, and Sage to help her take down Bart, which I really loved. Bart Bass may be able to fool the FBI, but he has never had to face off against Blair Waldorf and her bitches. I loved that they were able to have this proper, like, girl power moment um, with everyone coming together to try and take Bart down. I just thought that was so fun and I just really love it and the dynamic between the five of them. And it's such a well thought out scheme. Like Blair had this to a T. She had it to a T, it was so good. So the plan almost works until she sees on the TV that the bass plane crashed and she believes that Chuck was in it and that he has died, but it's actually revealed that Chuck is alive and Dan, um, introduces him and kind of helps him make his grand entrance to reveal what Bart had done to him. 
And so Blair briefly forgives Dan because she helped Chuck, but then immediately does a 180 and Uno reverse card when she finds out that Serena might be moving to LA because of what Dan did to her, which was posting his kind of scathing Serena chapter. Blair begs her to stay, um, and we see this development from her, which I really love, saying that they can both shine in New York. They don't have to be separate, whereas obviously in seasons one and two, there's a very big thing about how, and even three actually, that Blair doesn't want to be um, in Serena's shadow and that they just can't kind of coexist together. So I really liked this sign of growth that Blair was finally happy and that they could both um, thrive together as best friends rather than constantly being pitted against each other. There's no Sarah Bass in LA. Or serendipity. Or me. So then Blair finds out that Bart had gone up to the roof and she assumes that Chuck had followed him up there. So she goes up there and she sees Chuck and Bart fighting and obviously Bart goes over the side and he's clinging onto the rail and then Chuck and Blair watch as he loses his grip and he falls and they don't actually do anything to help him. So then at the end of the season, the full, the full on series finale, Chuck and Blair flee the scene of Bart's death and they go into a hiding where Jack finds them and says, look, it, you two are the only people on the roof, so if you get married, then Blair will be a wife and she won't have to testify against you in court and therefore no one will ever know that you were there and you'll be able to just, you know, it'll be ruled, Bart's death will be ruled an accident and you'll be good to go. And... Chuck's not really sure, but Blair says that she wants to marry him and he proposes to her, which is a really great scene. Life with you will never be boring. Blair, Cornelia Waldorf, will you marry me? Yes, yes, I will. So they go to town hall and you know, to get married, but Chuck decides that this isn't good enough. And so they orchestrate a last minute wedding with everyone in attendance. And it is so good. It's such a good scene. Blair looks absolutely gorgeous in her wedding dress. And um, I just love that scene with them. And Serena is so happy for them. And it was just really nice to see everyone together in that final scene. Three words, eight letters. Blair, you take Chuck to be your lawfully wedded husband? One more, three letters, yes. And then once they... They then get arrested <laughs> and once they come back from uh, the police station, they find out along with everyone else that Dan was Gossip Girl and initially Blair's upset but then quickly kind of gets over it when Serena's like, I'm fine with it and Chuck's like, our life's not really that bad because it's turned out pretty okay and everyone is just very quick to just kind of be like, no problem that you were Gossip Girl absolutely fine. So then in the flash forward, which is five years later, I believe, we see that Chuck and Blair have a son called Henry, which I really loved that she finally got to kind of have her child and her perfect family. And she's still running Waldorf Designs and they even have a line called J by Waldorf, um, where Jenny designs for them, which I thought was a really nice little tie in there. And Serena's wedding actually takes place in their apartment. And I really liked that little nod as well. Okay, so now that we've gone into each season individually, we're gonna now go over a couple of brief topics. So we're gonna talk about love interests. Like I said, I have a whole video going through each of them individually, but we're just gonna go over them a little bit now. I actually really liked Nate and Blair's storyline, obviously the cheating aside. I loved how they had, you know, she decided that despite the fairy tale feel of it all, that it was just, they were high school sweethearts and they just weren't supposed to progress beyond that. And that she makes that decision for her own personal growth. And I really like that. And I think that's definitely a really good anchor for some of her character development. Um, so I really love that story. And I also think that past that, he did really care about her. And I think it was kind of the relationship that she needed in that moment. I also enjoyed seeing her more rebellious side when she has that fling with Carter. And he was quite a good sparring partner for Chuck as well, which was an interesting dynamic. And like I mentioned, while Dan was not a love interest that I personally enjoyed, I did like how sweet they were. And like I said, you know, their comedic moments and how Dan genuinely loved her. He adored her. 
and they had all those little things that they would do together that, like I said, just spoke to Blair's more intellectual side. She had that kind of stimulating conversation with Dan. They would go and see the same movies and um, had those kind of similar interests, which we didn't really get to explore much with Blair outside of that friendship. But yeah, I definitely preferred them much more as friends. And I would have liked if they had become kind of a example of platonic soulmates rather than a relationship. And I think it's a shame that ultimately they go back to their dynamic of season one where she doesn't like him, she doesn't think he's good enough and everything like that. I think it would have been really nice to maybe have seen that he'd fallen for her, but then realized that they were better off as friends and they just never dated and they stayed that kind of close and had that close friendship even towards the even like at the end of the show lastly chuck is my favorite love interest of hers and i think it's undeniable that their connection and their relationship is one of the most exciting parts of the show and while i do agree with the criticisms of them and do agree that they have toxic moments i think they display so much emotion it's captivating and their chemistry is so good and ultimately i think sometimes the point of gossip girl has always been to show that these people are bad people <laughs> they are horrible people they aren't supposed to be a symbol of people to idolize or anything like that but i think chuck and blair while looking back at it there is parts of it that are really bad. Ultimately, I am really glad that they ended up together and I do love so many scenes of them together. I just don't think after all that, it would have felt right to her to have ended up with anyone else. So now we're gonna move on to friendships and Blair's main friendship is of course with Serena and they, like I've mentioned, are constantly portrayed as opposites to each other and used to help establish the other person's character and personality right from season one all the way to season six and despite being the best of friends they're definitely big frenemy energy and they spend a lot of the show feuding which i do think can get a little taxing especially with season six like i said it just feels really rushed to me and i wish they would have been friends for longer in season six than they are and i really liked how that friendship showcases blair's character development going from um resenting her to you know going from resenting her and being jealous of her to genuinely loving her and actually be ultimately becoming the better friend in that scenario and as i mentioned blair's friendship with dan is one of my favorites in the entire show they play off of each other so well their like friendship chemistry is 10 out of 10 the actors anytime they're in a scene together they just have they just are great um the way that they banter the way that they kind of have these little digs at each other is really funny and like i said he was one of the only people he was really the one of the only people to take an interest in the other sides of her personality and the more academic parts of her that i really wish we would have been able to delve more into throughout the show um and I think it's a shame that they kind of ruined it with the romance of it. I think Nate and Blair actually have a really sweet bond and a really sweet friendship. I enjoy their dynamic and I think I wish it hadn't have faded into the background so much because past season two, they don't really interact aside from little comments. And whenever they do get a scene together, it's always really funny. And I would have liked to have seen more of them. And I think as well, even just above that, Nate always really... Well, maybe not always, but I think he had a soft spot for her and really cared about her and wanted her and Chuck to succeed and be together. Obviously, last but not least, Dorota and Blair have one of the sweetest connections in the show. And we get to see that Dorota had a really big role in Blair's life growing up. I think Cyrus even says that Dorota practically raised Blair after, you know, through all those years and she had always loved her and had always wholeheartedly supported her, which I think has a lot to do with why Blair is as confident as she is and why she is so sure of herself because Dorota was always there encouraging her and making sure that she knew that she was beautiful and that she was strong and everything like that. Initially, she's just seen, obviously, as Blair's maid, but as the series goes on, we see that bond and that depth 
and we get a lot more layers to it. We get really funny moments, but we also get really emotional moments. And Dorota really becomes part of the family, even being included in the flash forward, which I really loved. So then we're going to move on to her family, which we only, we don't actually have that many people talk about. I feel like with Blair's family, I didn't, I don't know, I didn't find as much to talk about. I think with Serena's, we get a lot more scenes of her and Lily, with Lily being one of the main characters and William being a really big plot point. Whereas Harold, I think he's in three episodes. Um, so I didn't have a lot to go on, but we're going we're gonna to talk about them anyway. Obviously, Blair and Eleanor's relationship is very toxic when we first meet them, with Eleanor feeding into Blair's insecurities, despite knowing that she has an ED. She really, you know, just doesn't take any kind of care in the things that she says to her. And she's constantly praising Serena over her, even when it is so obvious that they are best friends and to not pit them against each other. But she still treats Serena like the golden child um, and constantly has criticisms and subtle nags at Blair. But fortunately, this kind of dynamic does only last for the, f I would say probably the first half of season one. And then she becomes a lot more of a likable character and their bond gets so much stronger when they start to be more vulnerable with each other and not just focus so intensely on that perfect image and that perfect kind of public perception. And we get to see sweeter moments from them and Blair even ends up in the later seasons confiding in her about things and about motherhood and I think that was nice to see that she had finally come to a place with Eleanor where she felt like she could go to her whereas in the early seasons it would have just been met with criticism or dismissal now she can have that proper uh, mother-daughter bond with her yeah I think some of my favorite moments of them together is when they discuss motherhood that's definitely I thought was a really sweet scene and also when she offers her the role of CEO of Waldorf Designs it was nice I think for Blair and her development to see that Eleanor truly believed in her and that she thought she had the talent and the vision to take over the company. No one could keep you from being your own person and that is part of why you will be a wonderful mother. Children don't do what you want them to do all the time when you want them to do it but you love them anyway oh. so like i said with harold her relationship with him isn't really delved into that much we know that she kind of puts him on a bit of a pedestal and past season one we don't see a lot about him but I do think his affair definitely has an effect on her character and the place that we find her in uh, when we start season one. I think not only did it have an effect on her um, personally, but I think it also has an effect on her relationship with Eleanor and how she sees Eleanor and she thinks very highly of Harold and doesn't want to disappoint him. And initially she does try to sabotage Roman, but then comes around and realizes there's still a place for her in their life. And I thought that was a sweet bit of closure there. So I don't think we really needed to have any more um, exploration into that dynamic. I felt like that kind of summed it up nicely. And it was nice to see him in the wedding episode as well um, to walk her down the aisle. I did like that, um, that little thing as well. And I also like that they do mention him throughout like she mentions going to Paris and then seeing him and so they kind of keep it but I understand why they didn't include more episodes because it wasn't really needed and then my favorite member of the Waldorf clan Cyrus Rose I love that man okay and Cyrus is obviously Blair's stepdad um, and he comes into her life later on but their bond is one of my favorites on the show it's probably is it the, I think it may be the, I mean, Rufus, you know, he obviously does love Jenny and, and Dan, but I honestly think that the bond between Blair and Cyrus is the most genuine child-parent relationships that we get in this show. 
I no joke. The way that he loves her, he's just so sweet and he absolutely adores her. I think my favorite moments from them are when she goes to Cyrus and he consoles her after she's heartbroken that Chuck didn't say that he loved her back. And also when she asks him to walk her down the aisle, I really liked as well. Oh, Cyrus, one father is not enough. I need both of you to walk me down the aisle. <laughs> I think having Cyrus definitely contributes a good part to her character development through those middle seasons and specifically when she meets him for the first time is a really big turning point in how she sees people and how superficial she is. So now I'm going to talk about career and education and of course Blair's the complete opposite to Serena and she takes school very seriously, she continuously gets straight A's and is distraught when Rachel Carr, the new teacher, ends up giving her a B and her dream was to get into Yale before ultimately sabotaging it through scheming. So then from there, she ends up attending NYU, um, where she struggles socially, but I think we're supposed to just assume that she thrives educationally there because she always has. We don't really see her going to any classes or anything. So I think I, yeah, wish they would have done more with the college setting because I think there was a lot of potential there, but we never really hear about college we only hear about the drama between the relationships and the friendships throughout college rather than college itself so then obviously she moves to Columbia where she does become invested in the community there as well as her classes and she even wants to be uh, one of the professor's assistants at one point which again I really liked I liked seeing her I don't know maybe the writers of these shows don't think that that stuff would be interesting to people and let me know if you don't think that it is or you do think that it is but I would love that anytime that the characters showcase interests outside of relationships and outside of the core stories that we've always known for them I always really enjoy it so then once Louis comes into the picture we don't hear about college again we don't know if she ever graduated if she dropped out I guess because she was going to be a princess she didn't really need college anymore so that kind of makes sense so then Blair ends up getting her internship at W where she does um, thrive and obviously she ended up earning it on her own which was another really great storyline um, I thought yeah just the whole, di di whole dynamic of her being an intern with Dan was really fun but then when she also got promoted I liked seeing that career trajectory for her and I wish they would have kept going with that a bit more especially as Serena started um having trying to have careers and going into different jobs I would have loved to have seen Blair kind of explore that same thing as well so yeah she's then promoted by her boss Eppley and then ultimately kind of struggles with the pressure and quits slash is fired and then of course her final job of the series which according to the reboot she is now retired from I think um but she thrived in is the CEO of Waldorf Designs and yeah obviously initially she kind of struggles to find her footing but then she finds her talent and what she can bring to the company and again I wish we would have had more time with this story I really enjoyed it so now we're going to look at style so hair makeup clothes um I'm going to have a more in-depth video like going into it a lot more like how I did with Serena proper Blair Waldorf style analysis but we're just going to do a little summary of it here as well because it's not a deep dive without it didn't realize that tights are not pants Blair obviously her and Serena the blonde the brunette that kind of whole dynamic of every blonde needs a brunette and her hairs I wouldn't say it's one of her big features in the show like how Serena's is really like the fact that she's blonde and it's you know this whole golden girl um thing but her being brunette does kind of play into the stereotypes of the brainy brunette as well as the bitchy brunette Blair's hair is always perfectly styled whether it's loosely curled or straightened as opposed to Serena's kind of messy effortless hair again this is used to establish how prim and proper Blair is and how much of a perfectionist she is in comparison to Serena who just kind of wakes up and is ready for the day Blair's makeup actually remains quite understated throughout the seasons um we have a couple of moments where she has some bold lip colors from time to time that's probably her more of a go-to but in terms of eye makeup she never really does any really bold looks there she definitely has more of a 
blush, sweet, like soft makeup look rather than the intense bronzy sun-kissed look. And she goes for more cool tone look, so like blue toned reds and pinks. So in season one, um, I think they really establish her style perfectly in season one. There's not any kind of um, growing pains with it. It is consistent and just changes with the, obviously the times and the trends that were going on. But you can always feel that sense of Blair Waldorf from season one to season six. She's always very put together and very well styled. Her makeup is very soft with neutrals and pinks. And we see her in a lot of red in the earlier episodes, which how I talked about before, characters that they want to be perceived as the antagonist are usually put in red um, to kind of symbolize that more evil side to them, I suppose. She also wears black a lot when she is scheming or when she's in a kind of darker emotional place. So then in season two, her style becomes a lot more studious and kind of academic focused when we edge closer to the college years. We see a lot of blazers and she has always loved a pattern. Um, I think in season one, it's definitely more kind of like bolder colors, whereas now we're kind of moving into bolder patterns. As we start this season in the summer months, we see a lot of summery, um, kind of color palettes from her. We see greens and oranges and florals and this kind of carries throughout the rest of the seasons as well. Again, her makeup doesn't change much. It's quite soft, um, but we do see a bold red lip from her when she's in more of her rebellious, darker side um, after having been rejected from Yale. So then with season three, we see a lot of fun and flirty looks from her, a lot of bright colors as she's very happy in her new relationship with Chuck and her more studious style takes a bit of a back seat. I think that's probably due to her going to NYU rather than Yale. Season four brings a lot of different plot points for Blair and her outfits kind of coincide with those. So initially when she's in Paris with Serena, it's yeah, cutesy summary, a lot of like runway um, looks from her. Then when she starts to become involved with Chuck again, we see a darker color palette come through. And then when she works at W, we see more professional office wear. This is then followed by more mature looks as she enters into a more adult, mature relationship with Louis and also becoming a royal. Season five is a gorgeous season for Blair. She looks incredible in this season. It's the first time we really get to see a shakeup in her hair and makeup as this is when... Um, it's revealed that she is pregnant. So they really want to kind of demonstrate that through very glowy makeup. She wears her hair in kind of like waves, almost like what they want us to believe is her like natural hair, how it just sits without being perfectly styled. And I love this look for her. I think she looks absolutely incredible. Again, like I said, we see a lot of bold colors and patterns from her. Um, I think that's definitely a Blair Waldorf signature is those kind of bold patterns. Once she is free from Louis, we do start to see a darker color palette from her as well as slightly bolder makeup looks, mainly coming from her lip color choice rather than eye makeup, like I mentioned. But I think she's definitely trying to rebel against the prim and proper perfect mold that the Grimaldis were trying to fit her in to please the public. This then follows her into season six and season six is definitely a darker color palette for her. I think this comes with um, the responsibility of now being the CEO of Waldorf Designs and, prevent, um, and presenting more professionally, but also due to the war between Chuck and Bart. She does a lot more scheming this season. And like I said, you know, in the first season when she's kind of scheming and trying to get revenge, she does wear a darker color palette. And also the kind of mourning of her and Chuck's potential that isn't being realized while he's still in this war with Bart, which I think is reflected in her wearing black more and having bolder makeup. At one point, she even opts for a dark smoky eye when she resigns from Waldorf Designs, which is very much not like her. Her wedding dress is also absolutely gorgeous. And I definitely think fits her better than the dress that she wore with Louis for that wedding and I think that kind of showcases that she's in a relationship where she is more able to truly be herself. 
Okay, so now we're going to move on to your opinions. And around 89% said that they did like Blair, with only 11% saying they didn't, which is an absolute landslide compared to when I did the poll for Serena. And it was like almost 50-50, I think. Maybe it was edging more on the side of liking her. But it was really... This is kind of what I expected. I knew that people really loved Blair. But 89%, I was like, wow. A lot of people said that while they wouldn't want to know her in real life and can recognize that she does bad things, she's the most entertaining character in the show and the best character in the show. While people that didn't like her character said that they voted that because of how cruel she was to people and also how she constantly thinks that she's better than everybody else. So my kind of final thoughts, you know, the beginning of the show versus the end of the show. When we meet Blair in season one, she is the queen of Constance. She's secretly struggling with her father's affair and what her best friend has done to her. She has a low self-esteem, but a very strong sense of self and who she is. Um, and even in season six, I think this is still true, despite the character development that we saw in between then. When she then becomes the CEO of Waldorf Designs, we see her question her talents and put herself down before reminding herself of who she was in high school and that she was, you know, who everyone wanted to be and wanted to dress like her, which was a nice callback to the first season and obviously getting to see the uniforms reimagined uh, for the line was really cool. But it felt almost a little bit odd because they actually feared her. Do you know what I mean? Like they wanted to be like her because she was obviously the queen of the school and she ruled with an iron fist, not really out of inspiring anyone. So I thought that was kind of an interesting take um, because that's not really how it worked, but I still enjoyed the little callback to it. So I'll take it. Dan even ends up saying in his article that she's stuck in high school, but I think that is truly only in that final season, we saw in season three how she told Serena that she was maturing and she was making a life for herself and she didn't want to be stuck in those high school ways. And then how when she'd broken up with Chuck that she wasn't going to engage in those games anymore and she was going to kiss someone when she felt ready. And that to me was so much personal growth for her that the fact that it all seems to just be forgotten in season six is really frustrating. Because I just feel like in other seasons, she showed how she can be selfless. She, how she had matured past that high school self and was able to put herself first and not put others down and be so cruel and genuinely better herself. So for then them to just go back to that trope of the high school bully, I don't know. I just, I just didn't like it. I adore Blair. I absolutely love her. And I just wish they hadn't regressed her character development because I do believe that she is one of the best characters, if not the best character in this show. I would have loved to have seen her have more time with the Waldorf designs storyline because I personally found it far more interesting than her relationship with Dan. To see how she truly navigated being a businesswoman once she'd gotten past her kind of petty growing pains to see what she would have done with the coming because ultimately when it started Gossip Girl was truly a show about fashion and they wanted it to be like a magazine you would watch it and you would see all the latest trends and what everyone's wearing and the music that is you know popular at the minute and I always loved those episodes like the um fashion show in season one is it yeah I think it's season one um for Waldorf Design, that's one of my favorite episodes. And I really enjoyed, again, the fashion show episode in season six, seeing Blair open that pop-up store. I would have loved to have seen more of that. In terms of her ending, I did like that she ended up with Chuck and that she got to have a child of her own after losing her first baby. And I also like that ultimately her and Jenny were able to make amends and that Jenny now designs for Waldorf Designs. Like I've said many a time, it's impossible to talk about Blair without also talking about Serena and vice versa, but their friendship is one of my absolute favorite things about the show. I adore it. It's like with Pretty Little Liars, the friendship between the liars is what makes me love the show so much. And I loved how Blair became a truly genuine friend to her, was able to step out of her shadow. And I think that they are the true soulmates of Gossip Girl. All in all, I love Blair. I absolutely love her. She makes the show so entertaining her Leighton played her 
just incredibly. Her acting, the emotion that you feel when Blair's on screen, I think she is truly one of the backbones of this show. And not only that, but I think she's become a icon, <laughs> kind of a pop culture, with people st still to this day trying to live her aesthetic. And you see on TikTok and Pinterest, that kind of Blair Waldorf um, life that people will try to emulate, which I think is really cool. I love seeing that impact that a character can have on a whole generation of people that watch that show and continue to watch it now. And I think she will forever be one of the most legendary women in popular media. So I, I absolutely love her. So that is it. That is the Blair Waldorf deep dive all done and finished. It only took four separate times trying to film it. This video was cursed, but it's okay. We, we got there in the end. Well, hopefully, because I still have to edit some of it. Yeah, but fingers crossed. It's fine. It's fine. You're seeing it. So whatever happened, it's all worked out. And yes, thank you so much for watching this video. Make sure that you like and comment and subscribe. There is a poll up right now on my community tab if you want to vote for who should be the next um, subject of one of these character deep dives. And I will leave my second channel below as well as my podcast that I do with my best friend Miranda. Let me know what you think of Blair down below. Any and all opinions. I want to hear them all. So yeah. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. And I will see you in the next one. Bye. I'm finished. Yay. Yay. Have a little faith. And if that doesn't work, a lot of mimosas. <laughs>